What's good, people? This is the Option Podcast. This is episode 166, as in Route 66. Oh my God, that dude looks like Dive, aka <laughs> Sexy Jesus. <laughs> the episode starts. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to go live anymore, honestly. Right now. <laughs> We were talking about Elvis. I just saw Elvis. Yeah. Uh, someone showed me a trailer. Like when trailer um like one of his concerts, they were telling him he wasn't allowed to do this and do that. And he just looked at everybody and just lost his mind and his and his agent perfect. And his agent was trying to get him um get him off the stage. And I saw like this five minute bit, this clip, and I'm like, I gotta see this movie, man. Um, Elvis, oh, man. <clears throat> yeah. Yo. That movie, I've watched that movie like <laughs> I think I I watched it like six times already. Mm. I mean, it's a long movie. It's like almost yeah. three hours, right? Yeah, it's two forty-seven. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it's basically like a three-hour movie. But dude, yeah. oh, I love that movie so much. Yeah. And um, I mean, we were talking about it earlier, but like, uh, I was named after Elvis. Like, my middle name is Presley, and so like, I grew up and I like I loved. <clears throat> um, what was the actor's name for Elvis? I forget his name. Oh, yeah. it's uh. T- t- uh Something Tyler, right? I'm putting it up. I'm putting yeah, what's his name? Oh no, but the dude is drop dead gorgeous. Austin Butler. That's <clears> okay. <throat> yeah, yeah, Austin Butler. That Austin guy Butler, killed it. Yeah. Well, apparently he, because uh, I watched him in an interview with uh, Lisa Presley, uh-huh. and she was like so worried that like they were gonna butcher who like who Elvis was or like 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 totally ruin his name and everything. Yeah. And, she was like crying in the interview with Austin Butler. She's like, it was so weird. There like he's Fair like, she, she was like, you were literally my dad, yeah. like in that film, like one hundred percent. And wow. it was like, it was a cool interview to watch. Yeah, yeah look at that. That is wild. Yeah. So spitting image, dude. Yeah, the same like piercing blue eyes. Same well, like I guess dead, it was smug. between him and I think <laughs> Harry Styles when it came down to like who they were gonna pick for the film. But then mm. like Harry couldn't sing like Austin could for like the Elvis <laughs> right. Uh, like interpreting, you know, interpretation. And when you look back retrospectively, you they know they made the right choice. Oh yeah, you know they made the right oh, choice. Oh yeah, that film is phenomenal. Like I watched that so many times already. Yeah, he already won an Oscar. I mean, um, I'm sorry, I won a Golden Globe. Oh yeah, uh, which means yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> automatically means like if you don't know who's nominated for for an Oscar, he's probably nominated, and wouldn't be terribly surprised if he won. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do There's like no way he's not gonna win. That and I movie do, is amazing. And I do like the movie because mm-hmm. it shows, like, there's some people who are idiots, and you hear a story about them, and you find out they're, they're just idiots, right? There's no, mm-hmm. they're not misunderstood. No, they're just they're just a hole, you know. And then there's some people that they are misunderstood. This yeah. dude, this dude, like, if you look at all of his worst moments, and we talked about it before the podcast as well severely misunderstood like one of the things a lot of my black friends because i grew up in brooklyn they're like they ain't down with elvis because he said he once said the only thing a black man could do for me is shine my shoes right and yeah. that's honestly that is as racist as something as someone could you know in, in the in the classic definition of the word the inherent mm-hmm. belief that is one is superior or inferior based on their race but you also have to consider this and you and you me and you talked about it a little bit and i'm gonna carry this water for you okay yeah so for us at that time period, that wasn't a terrible thing to say. That was just, people just pointed out race and just said whatever they wanted, black people and white people. The other thing was too, there was this immense amount of pressure where they were asking him questions that were taking, that sounded like it was taking away from the work that he put in, mm-hmm. right? He did get a lot of his ideas from black people, from rhythm and blues. Well, because he grew and, up with the culture. Yes. You know, like like when you grow up around something, like that becomes your mm-hmm. culture. And like he grew up in the ghettos, like around black mm-hmm. culture and like that's that's what he he felt most connected to like through his music and that's where he found music mm-hmm. was through like black culture's music and that's like literally when he first started like listening to music started writing music and then um and like that's like that's what he grew up around like if if, if, he, if you're a, a, a dude from egypt and you grow up in jamaica like you're gonna listen to jamaican music like Probably, you're gonna yes. be playing jamaica <laughs> like especially if you're an artist you know so it's like he grew up in a place where he was around black culture and like black music all the time. And then people are like, Oh, like he stole black people's music, whatever. Da, da. And it's like, no, like he just grew up around that. Like that's, that's right. And then if you look at 
any artist from like the 30s to the 70s, mm-hmm. all they did was record other people's music and like do their own renditions of it. Yeah, and, and most was, people didn't even write also, their music. But there's also an exception to of stealing um, someone's idea and making it your own. There's that's this in art in in the artist world. All right, yeah. you're you are. You are this massive freestyle hip hop, all right? I'm a former mm-hmm. theater performer. And there's an old saying. You'll love this one. Yeah. Good artists create, great artists steal. Okay. <laughs> Good artists create, yeah. great artists steal. All the way back from Shakespeare. Shakespeare, if you look at Hamlet, all of the Seneca, all of the characters, they're called Seneca characters because Seneca is a playwright that created the ghost, the good guy, the the assassinated, like the guy that kisses the bad guy's butt, walks around. All mm-hmm. of those characters were, were were already shaped, and Shakespeare took the idea and ran away with it. What are you gonna say? Because you have a thought. Yeah, well, I was gonna say like when when I look back at like all the artists, like every color, like yeah. during that time period in the early twentieth century, or like even early to mid. Uh huh. Almost every single one of their big songs is just a song based, like, like literally, like, doing a rendition of someone else's song. Yes. And then a lot of people think, like, oh, no, this person was the first person to do the song. Mm-hmm. And then you look back and you're like, no, this artist did it before them. This artist did it before them. Like, look at, like, Amy Winehouse. Like, her, like, biggest song, Valerie, yeah. is another band song. But everyone's like, no, that's Amy Winehouse. It's like, no, it's not. That's a whole different <laughs> band from, like, a decade before. And it like like uh, or if you look at like Benny King, like he sang yep. a lot of other people's music. Yes. Like that's what people did is like, but they didn't do it. Like they didn't steal it. No, they would ask the artists and ask the labels, "Hey, can we record this song?" Because I was just right. that's what they did back then. They're like, "Hey, I'd love to do a recording of this song. Right, that's an amazing song. I'd yeah. love to record that." And then they would record their own version, and then that you know if and if it blew up bigger than the other artists, it's like, well, I mean that sucks for that other artist, but yeah. That's that's what it is. I think what I'm trying to say is if people want to use the word steal as the operative word, they have to make sure the definition is clear. Yeah. Because the word steal gets it gets like this bad rap. I don't a lot of people like artists, we don't use stealing as as um Well, we use covers you, yes. these days. Like they didn't have they like didn't for use us, that as a word. The word back is then. bit. Like the bad word is bit. Right. Bit, right, right. bit meaning you literally took every word yeah. and, and, and every idea. And then claimed it as your and own. And claimed it as your own. But back then, yeah. like, they, they said, like, oh, I'm doing this yeah. song. Like, this is by this person. Yeah. And then they would record it. But we all get that, right? Yeah. Look, who is going to tell me that Dolly Parton's I'll Always Love You is better than Whitney Houston? Nobody. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, oh. He just walked by. It's, it's the one guy. <laughs> oh, shoot. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> But for the rest of the world, I don't mean to get on a bandwagon fallacy, assuming that a premise is popular because it's true, true because it's popular. But no, no, Whitney was better. So well, it's like, OK, so like recently I, I did a cover of Louis Capaldi's like someone you loved. Yeah. And I did a cover of that. If someone's never heard that song before uh-huh. and they saw me singing that and playing it, they would think that's my song. And then if and if that blew up and I put it on Spotify and I released it like everywhere, like hey, this is my rendition of this. But people just heard it, they'd be like, oh wow, that song by Dive is really good. But that's just people not doing research or caring. And like that's the same way how people get their news. Like yeah. people get their news from just like one little clip on Twitter, mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, this is what's going on in the world. It's like, yeah. you, like you didn't look into it at all, and they're just perpetuating whatever's going on. I feel like this is a similar thing with music, 100%. where if someone like is is or like uh, like lately there's been a lot of artists who are like oh this artist is stealing this song or oh they stole this flow from this rapper or they stole this from this and it's like but then the songs are like wildly different you know (laughs) but that because it's just like brings up a story and people are like yeah and you know i I I also think that the people that might have portrayed the original version of it are grateful like I don't think Dolly Parton's out there singing I'll Always Hate You to Whitney, right? Uh, uh-huh. Because the first time a lot of people heard the song I'll Always Love You was Whitney. Yeah. Right? A lot of people, um, you you and I were big time karaoke heads, right? Yeah. There's a lot of songs you sing that I, I've never even heard the radio version of. And then, exactly. Then, so then when I hear the radio version, it's, my it's version, like, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like I used to sing in New York, like, Everyone has like a go-to song, even though we don't. We we uh, we're, we're two people that sing whatever we want, but 
you measure a crowd and you and and like a genre of music that's appropriate sometimes. Some, mm -hmm. Sometimes you want to sing something, you have to get something off your chest, and sometimes you want to entertain. So I sang. This is how we do it. Like almost every week at this place called the Parlor, like every Sunday this night. Is how we do it. And the host, oh, her name is Kristen Velasco. She's like, I never even I heard the song one day at Montel Jordan. And she's like. I like yours better. <laughs> and I'm like, it's because you're by it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but, but great point though, right? Like, like we, yeah, we so I, sometimes I the, 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 the first time someone will ever hear that song mm -hmm. is the remake that you, you took but, and ran away. Yeah. From. And, but that was, and so what I'm saying is like the earlier decades, like whenever they would record someone else's song, they wouldn't put like, Oh, cover or remix or whatever. They would just, that's the name of the song. And, but it's, it's them doing it. So it's their rendition of it. Right. And nowadays, whenever you do something like that, you're like, like you put in the title, like, I will always love you cover or like remix or rendition or whatever, you know, to, to point it out. But back in the day, no one did that. Plus, no one wrote their songs back in the day. No. Like there was a few people who did. I hand, like I was recently going through Benny King's catalog and I was like looking up. Uh, it was like for a separate project, like thing I'm working on or whatever. Um, but I was looking up like music he wrote and he only wrote like five songs yeah out of his like 80 song 90 song catalog and a lot of the songs he did were like also renditions of other people's music and you know but like people don't talk about that kind of things people don't know about it it's true uh but he did write stand by me which is like his biggest song ever so i guess if you're yeah. a one hit wonder like that's the last one to pick you know Dude, yes yeah dude that's but now i love his music and yeah. like even though i know he didn't write most of his stuff i still love his music of course, yeah. Because it's like his delivery on it, you know, like you, like he believes what he's saying and believes what he's singing. Like right now, while you're talking, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at the percentages of people that write their own music, and I think you'd be surprised that it's still almost the same number. So we're thinking that was that was like an old school concept, but um, well, it was an old school concept to to not state whether or not you did, and uh, I think they even hit it more back then because they're like, yeah, this is the actual artist like doing this. And nowadays people just, I, don't, I feel like people just don't care mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. Like I, I kind of care. Like if I really like an artist and I find out they don't write their music, it just makes me feel less connected to that artist. Right. Like if I write like right now, like, uh, cause J Cole was a huge influence in me from like 2009 to like 2017, you know, like 2018. And if I find out he didn't write any of his music, I would, I don't know. I would like, might not be a fan, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm looking up how many people write their own songs. Um, Bieber. Yeah. Well, we knew that one. Yeah. Uh, Maroon 5, Taylor Swift. Like, um, just, if we're just talking like. She's wrote some of her music though, yeah. hasn't she? Like her earlier stuff. Didn't she Maroon write? Swift, Taylor. Well, let's look it up. Let's take a look at yeah, this. Yeah. I think her like early projects. I think her early projects, she did write some of her own stuff. Let's zoom in on that. Collaborative. Taylor Swift has made her career on sharing her own story and being a songwriter. So we think it's safe to say that this country turned pop star writes her own songs. Well, most of them. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but then, yeah, cool. then I guess when you're like researching it, sometimes like <clears throat> the way the way writing sessions work. If you're in a, if, if there's other people in the room and they even contribute to like, oh, you should use they are instead of there, they're now That's written it. down as someone who helped contribute right for the song. There it is. Yeah. So if you, sometimes if people are just even in the room, they can get points on the song, even though they don't say a single thing. <laughs> it, dude, it's so <laughs> weird. It's so weird. Someone will be in a room writing music and like getting a lot of stuff um like getting like like they're they're doing like 99 percent of the work and there's just like two or three other motherfuckers in the room they can somehow get points on that track just for being in the room it's just so wild. look i mean the person that they borrowed the room from probably gonna get credit too right yeah this or is, they could just be like yo that was dope you should do that and then all of a sudden they're written down as points it's Man. like what dude i got movie credits from people using my apartment in manhattan <laughs> i got i got movie yeah, credits right, yeah right that. so it's, it's just so weird because and i i think I, I understand it's like all based on like legalities mm. and, and whatnot but mm. end of the day like if you write the song you write the song and like i've i've been in rooms where I've helped other artists write music mm -hmm. and I didn't take any credit for it. I'm like, 
It's your song. Release it. Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah I don't I don't need to be on like I know I I, I wrote that whole hook. Yes. But I've no. ghost I've ghost writing for some people. But it gets it out there. That's the point I was trying to make. It gets it out there. Yeah. It's not like Millie Vanilli where like they lip sync in it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's literally like a voice Britney Spears. singing all the songs <laughs> yeah. and these guys are Oh my God! Did we talk about that last time, Millie? What? Like how they how they got exposed? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. is that the American well, music? Didn't, didn't it cut out? And then it, it was uh because they were using um they didn't have like um computer things. Yeah. So it skipped. I think it was a CD. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, a CD yeah, yeah. or a record. The vinyl. That was I think it was the vinyl that skipped. Yeah. Yeah, girl, you know it. And then, girl, and then it, it stuck, didn't it? It got it, like, stuck. stuck. Yeah. And then one guy just kept repeating it, and the other guy ran off the stage. That's so bad. <laughs> I'm gonna look up that. Come on, yo. Uh, YouTube is my YouTube is our friend, right? Come on, let's look up Millie Vanilli. <laughs> now look, so as far as beats go, man, I need to set this up like right. Yo, as far as beats go, anything goes. Yeah, anything goes. Let me. This is kind of hard, actually. If I just have it set right here. Yeah, you could just put it on the um the recorder. No, I'm kind of like I'm just facing it towards the. Oh, towards that. damn that. Oh, it's I kinda, see. Yeah, yeah, see what I mean? So let's, um... I don't know how to set this up. Let's use that. The camera. Your lens is uh, above it. Box. So you could just put that, yeah. Yeah. Now lean in on the box, because your lens your lens is above the box. Hey, I'm dropping shit. <laughs> could you please show some focus? <laughs> All right, so I'll give you an example while you're doing that. Like, mm -hmm. there's a beat. You know Nori's beat? Nothing. Like, what you gonna do? Yeah. Oh, boy, I came to party, right? And there's a new song called Billie Eilish. It's this. It's almost the same. Oh, by, uh, yes. Armani Blanco. Or whatever. It's almost the same like thing. So, yeah. But Black tack, big T-shirt, Billie Eilish. Eilish. Oh my God. But this, actually, it's the same musical score. Uh, almost dude. the same score. I met that dude uh -huh. before he uh, before he blew up. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I met him like, I think it was like a year and a half ago or something like that. And then I. <sighs> We like we're supposed to be in like a group and we like message about something, and then I remember seeing him like, like a couple months later. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot I met this dude, whatever. Da, da. And then I saw he dropped that song. I was like, oh, wow. that's just kind of hard. And then I remember him posting about it and like hitting someone up that I knew, saying like, oh yeah, we're trying to get the rights to be able to, because they like I think they sampled Billie Eilish in that song. Yes. So they were like waiting for the rights, and then they finally got the rights to be able to like drop it, drop it. Why and then they started, and then they released it. I was like, oh, this shit's dope. And then it just blew up, and now he's like a huge artist. And it, and the song's like only a minute and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not Check that long. Stylish. <laughs> when the talk Black shit tap to BT shirt Billie Eilish. <laughs> yeah, no good bangs though. Yeah, right. Yeah, shit's dope. Maha, first class, I'm the pilot. <laughs> yeah. And then put it in perspective. Yeah. Get out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not put it in perspective. <laughs> put it in perspective. That was oh, I got my I got my clip up. My clip for Millie Vanilli. Let's check it out. Let's see if they could do that. Yes. Like someone else recorded it and then they went out and like that is so crazy to me. And they were like the top recording seller. I mean I mean Yeah, they were that's, huge. That's my age group, so I yeah. I, I could tell you for sure that Yeah. You know, everybody, even in the hood, was was doing Milli Vanilli. Yeah. But I guess I was actually just looking for the part where they ran off. They don't have that. I was looking for the YouTube video where mm -hmm. the, where it was the skip. The record kept, or the CD kept skipping. And one, yeah, guy, yeah. one guy looped it like 10 times, as many times as he could. And the other guy just, he literally ran off That's the That's so stage. funny. That's crazy that they never even like wrote or like recorded. Like it was a different mm -hmm. person's voice. Mm-hmm. And how does someone not catch that when they're like in an interview? Because like my voice at least sounds like my rapping. Yeah. I guess when I first meet people, they'll like hear me talk and then they hear me rap and they're like, like, because they're not used to hearing how people's voices are compared to how they talk. Like I'm used to that because I record so much and I've recorded so many other people where I can distinguish like I can hear someone singing or like rapping that I've only ever heard talk and I'm like, oh, that's this person. Right. But I'm like used to hearing that. But like other people aren't used to hearing the difference between like what you sound like singing or rapping versus how you sing when you're talking. <laughs> so people will be like, yo, like who, who's this? Yeah. I'm like, that's me. They're like, that doesn't sound like you at all. And I'm like, yeah. that's literally like my voice on a beat. This like I'm just rapping. Like rapping is just like my, like literally like talking a little, you know, with some different inflections and, yeah. and whatever. But that's, yeah. yeah that's but me. If, dive, if, if we're just talking about you, mm -hmm. 
Um, and using that as a small sample size. Yeah. There's no way they can't know that's you. <laughs> There's no way they can't know that's you, man. I, I know. know that's you. And I I met you before I even knew you were a hip hop artist. I thought you were a voice. Yeah. Because the, the only way, I, the only association at that time was singing. Mm-hmm. I never heard you freestyle. You know, and, and look, for the people listening to this podcast, all right, there's two kinds of singers. I'm going to be real. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's someone, maybe there's one of your friends that you, you're like, wow, I didn't even have a voice. And when it's dunk singing, you're all clapping. You, you're roaring like, oh, yeah, that's our boy. You know, this and that. So that's one kind of singer. And then there's someone that sings so well. When he's done singing, you can't, you can't clap because you're frozen. You can't talk. You can't, your, your jaw's dropped. Like, dude, you didn't tell me we had one of those in the room. Um, so the first one is me, you know, because I got mad skills, right? Yeah, you got skills. And the second one is you. <laughs> dude, what's, what's funny is like, so I, I know what you're talking about. Um, when I was growing up, there was a couple artists that like I did like school musicals with and I was in choir with because I, I was a terrible singer. I was so bad. What? When I first started, yeah, when I was like, because I started doing like musical theater and stuff when I was like six and all the way up until like high school, I was like a terrible singer. And because I was like, I was good at everything growing up. And like, that sounds like really like arrogant or whatever, but like, that's just the truth. Like everything I tried, like I was good at. The one thing I was not good at was singing. And that's the one thing I wanted to do. And I could not do it at all. And so I, um, um, I was like, you know, I want to learn how to sing because uh every time i because i love performing i love being on stage or whatever and i heard if you like practice and practice you can become a good singer and i used to like practice songs and my mom would like cringe like every time i sang (laughs) and like because i was so bad and then uh getting into high school i joined choir in high school and it took me like four years to like learn how to hit notes and pitch and my ears started developing and then like everything started to develop and um, I started getting better and better at singing, and then I uh, got my tonsils taken out, and I could sing a lot better. And uh, and then I just kept practicing and practicing, and I just studied from a bunch of different artists and, and whatever. And then eventually, I got to the point where I could sing. But the the what you talked about a minute ago, I remember there was like the people who would sing, and everyone was like, "Oh, damn, this person's good." And then like you'd still just be going about your, especially like in in theater. Cause uh, you'd be off to the side, like around whatever, while someone else is practicing. And then there was like this one or two singers, especially this one kid I went to high school with that was phenomenal. And, and he was so good where everyone else would be off. Like we're all talking, whatever he starts singing and everyone just stops their conversation and just the whole room is just dead silent while he's singing. And the whole room is just out there like, Oh my God, he is so good and just everyone is so drawn to it in my whole life i was like i want that experience like i want to be so good where the whole crowd just is quiet and they're engaged and they're listening and that's what i wanted my whole life and it took me like eight years nine years to get to the point where i can kind of do that like i'm not the craziest singer in the world but you are the craziest singer in the world (laughs) no (laughs) yes you are no i can I can practice a song well enough mm. where I can I and I have a really unique tone. Mm. I feel like not a lot of people have my tone. And I think that's what is uh that's that's how I can get by as being like a better singer is because like it's different. Right. You know, people hear my voice and they're like, I don't sound like anyone else. Mm. Which is c- cool until I blow up and then all of a sudden there's gonna be like a thousand people that sound like me, you know. <laughs> but there there is a mainstream sound um that is um octave specific you mm. know what i'm saying like there are some some guys that are they're they're not barry white but they're not maroon five either mm-hmm. and, and they're they're i call them ranged uh octave tweeners they're, octave they're, tweeners. And, they're and they're probably never going to be um out there because it's not the the the, the pitch or the yeah. style or the style that 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 what some of the um i guess promoters of what they consider trendy or what they consider hip so mm-hmm. you are you are in the eye of the storm of that octave range, not not to mention someone who knows their limitations that plays to it, you know. Yeah. And hopefully every week, you know, that's one limitation less and less because me, when I was singing, <clears throat> like right now, you don't, you can't hear on the voice, but um, if there was a note I couldn't hit, 
like you you practice it until you could yeah and, and then and then you're like what range what limitations i don't know what you're talking about mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and if i have a good cold i could do barry white i could do yeah. i could do secret <laughs> garden right <laughs> yeah like i'll be sure it's up here like like for example i'll be sure it's, i want to be with you let me lay beside you do what you want me to Oh night. Nice. And go. then and then Barry White is like, I'll take good care of you. <laughs> you know, oh my and but that comes from sack dude. That yeah. comes from down here, yeah, man. So, a little bit more. But I think what makes you unique, um, is you are okay you have your own original sound that belongs to you mm -hmm. and you can also take some of these songs and make it your own like pr pretty much from american idol season one that's what uh, all of these good singers are challenging right like for me because my degrees in theater performance i will always be entertain people because i can do good impressions right like if, if it's black street i actually I, I listen to them and i adapt that sound and i sound like black street mm -hmm. right if i'm doing a british film i'll watch like snatch or whatever you know no no thank you turkish I'm sweet enough, you know, so you start hearing these accents and you become that. So my um, range and skill in some of these songs came from just imp um, impressions of that person. And what's evolved is that um, some of these songs I'm making my own, like you heard me sing all of me. I, yeah. I can't be John Legend. There's some people I can't be, you know, yeah. but but I can rock some all of me, you know. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I feel like that's how you, you have to learn how to sing is like you have to imitate other artists <clears throat> and you have to like you, like there's certain artists that i would listen to growing up and i listen to like every single genre and i think that's what's kind of helped me figure out my own sound mm -hmm. but you have to practice singing like as if you're that other artist and figure out how they sing like how they're doing certain runs or how their tone is or why they add certain afflictions to some vowels and not other ones and right. when you fully learn that artist mm -hmm. Then you move on to another artist and then you start training for that artist. And and I feel like uh, a lot of people, uh, especially who sing in like a tenor range like I do. And, uh -huh. and like I know you sing in baritone <clears throat> tenor range. Um, a lot of coaches will have them like sing like Michael or sing, you know, or like sing people who like have that higher, higher range. And then until you practice that tone over and over again and then you start working on another artist and then another artist and. And that's how you that's how you learn your voice is by imitating through other people's yeah. voices. And isn't it cool that once you conquer certain demons, like there's certain songs where you're trying to hit a note and, and it doesn't sound right. And when you finally get there where you're comfortable hitting that note, you're just like there's almost like this exhale, like yeah. God, now I could get on with life, you know, now yeah. I could get on with, with other things. For So for the people who are, who are trying to keep up with this, I'll give you an example. Um, the song Mad World, Gary Jules, mm -hmm. like you can sing, um, um, how's it go? Like, I went to school and I was very nervous. No one knew who may, no one knew who may. Mm -hmm. I didn't say me, I mm -hmm. said may right but it goes by some people because um you know look right through who may look right through who may well um, it's easier right to you hold, see, see how it's, but you see how it wasn't me look right through me well because if you may. say me it, it shortens your uh it like closes your throat up uh -huh. and it closes your um your mouth like when you say me because you have to open your mouth but when you say may you can open you can fully open your mouth and then and, and that's why a lot of artists will like use certain vowels like that or like change words. Mm -hmm. So when you say me, it's like it's so wide and you can't get an air out and it's all it's all in your upper uh, upper part of your voice. But when you say may, it opens up so you can like use your diaphragm and your voice can open up and you can really round out that sound. So then you can control it a lot better because when you say me, it's too it's you. You can't control it. It's just me. You know, it's there's nothing. But we say may you can fully open up your mouth. May, may you know, like your mouth can open yeah. up. You can't say me like me. Yeah, you know? that, that is no, definitely some O's and O's, man. <laughs> to yeah. get some out there, some O's, O's, yeah. O's and O's. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of different things you can practice mm. to to just kind of help. Uh, help your sound just be a lot be a lot more clear i i guess because because another another thing with the whole me may thing is when you say me those e sounds tend to like make you a little flat 
it'll yeah. bring you down a little bit because w- when you can and like 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 i said again when you like can fully open up your mouth and like use your full diaphragm like you can you're just up a little bit more on that note as compared to like being flat when you when right. you say like a me and plus it's just not a pretty like me is not a pretty sound when you're holding it for you know a whole measure or like couple measures like me <laughs> no. yeah it's yeah, not and, pretty and when i heard mad world the first time i heard mad world wasn't gary jules mm-hmm. it was adam lambert at american idol mm. um and he's the one that took the e to the to the a yeah he, he and, took and, the e to the a and simon i think that there was an episode that was only like 20 seconds left so mm-hmm. all three judges couldn't talk and simon's like we're running out of time so we don't have a lot to you know so i'm just going to do this and he stood up and clapped so yeah <laughs> and it made like all the headlines simon oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. silently stood up and clapped because right. they only yeah. had time to do one thing and i thought that was really cool. yeah well if you listen to like <laughs> amy winehouse singing valerie yes valerie yeah she didn't say valerie she's no. like valerie you know and she like it she like really hits the a uh-huh. part when the song is called valerie and she she uses as valerie and she, but that's just another thing where you you don't want to use e's you want to like open up and say a E's and A's have always been a challenge for me to understand because as an actor, I understood consonants and vowels. I understood mm-hmm. in what, like, how consonants um, apply to something that's intellectually tickling where, and vowels are more like to get an emotional response out of someone, mm-hmm. you know? This is why when someone argues with someone, you hear values of, of vowels more than consonants, right? Mm-hmm. They, they had plenty of time, right? <laughs> they didn't even, he didn't say plenty. He didn't wet his teeth. Right. They had right. plenty, right? Because if he had a T, plenty of time is just like. It's harsh. So what would you just say? Yeah, it's really plenty harsh. Plenty of time is like, no, he didn't. He, had a, he didn't have yeah. plenty of time. So. <laughs> yeah, and I, I noticed that a lot too, like when I'm rapping or especially, or when I'm writing. I'll I'll be on the mic and like sometimes I'll like freestyle to get my words or whatever or, or I'll write words and I'm like oh this sounds like this bar is really good and I'll go and rap it but it doesn't sound good because of the certain letters and afflictions and vowels and consonants and certain things that I'm using so I'll have to sometimes I'll write a concept and then freestyle that concept because when I freestyle it's a lot of uh, what I hear vocally Mm -hmm. so i like i i hear certain vowels i want to use and certain runs i want to use that sound pretty and it might not be the best words but it it sounds pretty so then i try to combine what i wrote with the uh kind of freestyle um sound i want to create and i'll like combine it together to where now it sounds pretty because there's a lot of rappers who will say some really good stuff like they'll be saying some really cool things, but it just sounds like, shit. and you're like, I like what he's saying, but you almost don't like it. And then, and then there's the opposite effect where on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who sound really good, but they're not saying shit. <laughs> like they don't. Yeah. So you have to find a way to, to kind of in the middle, like you have to sound good with what you're saying and then sound good with how you're saying it. And that's give, that's how I like to create my music. I give you an example. Um, Mims, right? Mims, the song "This Is Why I'm Hot." Oh yeah. There's probably not a song at that time this period that hot. was that was so stupid, <laughs> right? Um, right. This is why I'm hot. <laughs> right. I'm hot. I'm hot. Yeah. Hot this is why fly. You, you ain't because you not. not. <laughs> this is why. why. <laughs> this is why. This is why I'm hot. Now, if I'm listening to that in my house, I'm yeah. like, and then you see the artist, I'm like. Dude, okay. I right, first of all, this dude ain't hot, right? So he, okay. See, he's not. It's not coming from an honest place, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Or then again, maybe because he's making money, you know. And mm-hmm. then, but then when you boom it in your car, there's not a song. There's no. There's no song you want to replace that. You mm-hmm. like all of a sudden, do 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 do, and you in your car, and then all of a sudden, yeah, the bass. This comes is why up. I'm hot. <laughs> yeah. this, and and you in your car like this. This is why. This is yeah. why. And then people are looking at you like. And then you're like, I'm hot. Like, ah, you, <laughs> you ain't because you're not. not. <laughs> Plus, it was just right? fun to say. You know, so it was just I, fun to say. So yeah. you see that differentiation yeah. of what you, what everybody's like, it don't, it don't mean nothing. And you're like, but it and you're like, sounds I don't good. care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah it sounds it. good. You yeah. like the way it sounds. To your point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sure I could like come out. Maybe I'll like try this as an experiment someday. Like, I'll come out with a song 
that like is it's both sides you know like i was telling you where Mm -hmm. one side the words are phenomenally written like Uh so well written but they sound bad and then i'll have a song where it's just it sounds really pretty but like nothing's being said right and i'm guessing people will go with the latter because they because people like how things make them feel and it's usually after that where you have this juxtaposition where people um people start thinking after they feel you know it's it's not it's not like uh like when people start like when people resonate with something and then it makes them feel something then they think i don't think people think to ah. feel i think people feel to think yes that's a very tr- even if you have like a motivational speaker mm-hmm. you know he's saying words he's saying words and you're like kind of thinking but then he he hits a tone mm. where like or he says he says one thing that connects and now you feel the connection with him and now now he's got you thinking because of how he made you feel and it, like if, if you don't resonate with certain things like um if if someone's telling me something that could be really useful information mm-hmm. but i don't care about it i don't think it's useful information it's not i'm not going to resonate with it. i'm not going to remember it i'm not going to pay attention but as soon as they say like one thing that makes me feel something then i'm like oh okay now i'm gonna pay attention more because of how you feel so if you're saying a bunch of stuff and no one it doesn't resonate with anyone like no one feels it like then they're not gonna pay attention yeah Yeah, there's no point you stumbled onto something very interesting i think i did you really did because in theater there are some styles of theater like um stanislavski um sanford meisner there's a certain style of theater like if you get up and move across the room Mm -hmm. you need a reason to yeah Right. Yeah, I'm familiar. With and that. those people who are taught that are missing out with respect to that technique, which mm-hmm. has developed a lot of good actors, stage performers. But with respect to that technique, they're missing out on something that can really, really maximize who they are because they're like, I can't get up and move across the room unless I need a reason to. And that's not. What yeah. We're, and that's not what we're saying right now. Yeah. We're saying get up, move across the room, then come back, then go across the room again, then come back. How, yeah. How do they make you feel? I right, do it again. All right, cool. You feel better? Not different? Funky? And now you're exploring through a different process and technique that Trial by the time you're ready to Yeah, but by the time you're ready to perform it, it's more organic. And mm-hmm. it's and and if you're doing it night in and night out, let's let's say you're touring, right? It's mm-hmm. sustainable. You're not out there struggling trying to do it. You're just doing it. So um I'm glad you said that because there are certain styles of art uh, that artist feel like um what's my purpose what's my goal Mm -hmm. what's my goal what's my obstacle what's my tactics what's my expectations all of these things and i sound like i'm 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 not i swear to god i'm not doing that because that works for people too yeah but i think for them to do that and only that they're missing out on something that that could be really important in their lives so well it's that's a big that's a big pickup on your part yeah i uh i i've seen a lot of artists live like especially a lot of rappers and or like, yeah, I'm just artists in general. I've, I've seen a lot live. And one thing I noticed from like a good amount of artists is they can be good performers and they can be good vocalists, but they they don't have the mindset of like thinking from the crowd's perspective. Absolutely. So they So then they lose out on the connection with the crowd. And I mean, but you can still be connected with the crowd if they already know your music, they already love your music, whatever that's already a base but if you can connect with them in real time like that's such another level and i try to do that as much as i like when i perform i'm i'm not thinking about like how i'm rapping stuff like what i'm doing like i'm thinking about okay what what would make the crowd connect most during these songs and like i'll do mm-hmm. certain things where i'm like okay i'm going to start with these songs based on how the crowd looks and I'm going to build and I'm going to get their interest really quick. And then I'm going to try to keep it by like either sustaining the energy. And then when I drop it down to a slow song, I'm going to sit down on a bar stool, have the lights go low because now I'm already connected. So now I yes. can connect with them on a different level. And because they've already seen the big lights, they've already seen me coming out and sprinting around the whole yeah. place. And they're like, OK, yeah, like I like the energy. And then once once the connections there then I like to slow it down. And I like, if I can control all the lights, like I, it's a great show. That's like I love, what? I love yes. controlling everything like that. And like, yeah. I have, I bring my own fog machine. I have my own like lights and everything. So 
um one of the things i like to do is is like build mm. that instant hype because i like grabbing people's attention that aren't there to see me right so i'm like right out the gate i'm like, i'm giving them like 110 percent energy and they're like yo who the f i want you to hold that thought because we stumbled on something else okay. you being in control of things that you're responsible for yeah and i want i want to you you to make a mental note but i wanted to share a story about you with um, yeah um, some of the people. So I think it was Hennessy's Manhattan Beach. Mm -hmm. You and me, we usually do some, a lot of Mondays because Mondays is like maybe there's 15 people, maybe there's 50, but we try out some songs. And yeah, we, it's fun. Yeah, and right. It's almost like a lab. You try out yeah. songs and see if some people like it, right? So one Wednesday night, and this is for the audience listening. Um, uh, I've like one of my favorite go to songs. If I have to have a go to, is like All of Me. And then there's, of, of course, I'm feeling good, bubbling, mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and what? Stand by me. You, but there was one that you're like, I'm singing All of Me. I'm singing, I'm stealing your song, even though you, even though you sing it just as much as I do. So, yeah. and that was really cool saying you're stealing my song, but you weren't. So, <laughs> and I'm like, I know he's going to do that better than me. You know, there's a part of me that always says that. There's a part of me that always supports you because we support each other. Mm -hmm. But in that place, I'm like, this dude, this dude's gonna, this goes, this dude's gonna take what I do best and run away with it. So, and I said, no, no, let me. If I'm just gonna like it, I'm gonna appreciate it. So you sang all of me, and there was a girl on the table at the table, like somewhere near you, mm -hmm. was crying. <laughs> you no, made you made this girl cry, and no I said, you son of a. I love you so much. She was crying? Crying. No way. She was crying. And her friend was hugging her and and she was like, it's so beautiful. And, and she must have been And her up. friend's like, you didn't see her friend's like, go go say hi to him. She's she's like like she can't she can't do it. Like there's a part of her that didn't want you to see her cry. But yeah. she, at the same time, she she didn't not want you to let you know that she appreciated yourself. Mm-hmm. So that was like a side story I wanted to get to because no, I, like I call that I call that my you son of a because that's <laughs> that's my song. You took that song and you made someone cry. Mm -hmm. um, but you were talking about something where like you do your fog, you do you set up your own this, you orchestrate that. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm going to give you the floor you, uh, to be more elaborative because yeah. you can tell me about you more than I could tell you about you. Um, in the army, I had a sergeant that said, never have someone put you in a position where you're responsible for the mission, but they're the ones that tell you that, that are calling the shots. Mm. For example, yeah. if I'm in the middle of Absolutely. fixing a generator, right? And yeah. if I'm supposed in my procedures, I do something else first and someone comes along, I'm, I outrank you. No, you're doing that first. And then something goes wrong with it. No, and fault. they go to that guy. That guy's like, I didn't touch that. It was him. He touched it. It's his. It's his. He's. I didn't. And you know, I'm not the mechanic here. He is. So I'm just like, it's one of the reasons I like the army, and it's the same reason I left the army because it depends on your commander. You're, you know, I had, yeah, I had this captain, and I was like, okay, I'm fulfilling my obligation, and my obligation is up when out. So I'm giving you the floor because I think there's something else that was important. How important it is. How important is it to you? to call your own shots in relation to you being successful or responsible for the result in terms of shows that's like my biggest thing like i not necessarily have control but i want to have i want to have a full say on like how the show is set up and it's not uh, a closed-minded situation where i'm like i'm gonna give details and be like this is what i want this is what i want this is what i want and if it doesn't happen, like, it's, it's, sure, like, whatever, that's fine. But if I want to give an amazing show, I have, like, I'm like, I want this done. I want this done. I want this done. I want this done. We figure out what's realistic out of those things. And then we make it happen. Or if someone else has an idea, like, oh, what if we did this? I'm like, sure, that sounds mm -hmm. awesome. You know, like, I'm very open-minded to other people's ideas. And, and that's, like, with anyone I work with. So... I, I like even if, if like one day down the road I'm doing shows that I'm huge, you know. Let's say I'm like Drake level or something, I'm and I'm doing shows. If a stage hand came up to me and was like, "Yo, I think it'd be cooler if if you did this instead of this," I listen. Like I wouldn't be like, "Who the f are you getting paid yeah. hourly?" Like you, you know, you you're a nobody. You know, I wouldn't do that. Like yeah, I love hearing other people's perspectives, and maybe that dude's probably worked twenty years of shows. 
and knows what realistically looks good during a performance. So yeah. you never know. Um, but to, to get back on track, I, um, uh, if I were to set up a show, like I love controlling the mood. Cause I feel like I have, I'm really good at reading people. Like that's like one of my, like probably better traits. Like I'm very good at like reading the room, it's my like reading how people are. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. I don't, yeah. Yeah. And so like, I'm very good at that. So when I'm on a stage and I can feel the connection between the audience and how they're feeling. I want to be able to control that to to guide it to where it's a it's a whole performance. You know, I want people to be like there one of the things I hate right now about about movies is there's this really dumb thing that's been happening in the last decade. I fucking hate it. I'm holding onto my chair. Yeah. <laughs> It's so dumb. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's a directorial style that I absolutely hate. Where they take movies that are really good, really high budget. This could be an amazing movie. The storyline is awesome. And then they keep the pace like boom, 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 boom. And there's it's just all fast, the whole movie. Like the new Jurassic World movie. I so I so There's no topping. To to start with this, yeah. I love Jurassic Park. I grew up I watched Every single dinosaur documentary, I knew what every single dinosaur was. I was like, like animals, dinosaurs, history, like that. I watched everything. Like that was my favorite thing. So Jurassic Park, I love that movie, like that series so much. And then Jurassic World came around. I was like, this this movie series is dope too. I really like this. It was cool. And then the last one, they're gonna combine the Jurassic Park, and I was like, the nostalgia. I was like, no this way. is insane. That's a kitchen And I went mentality. to watch the movie. I don't know who the director was, but he that movie up yeah. because the whole movie was just scene, 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 scene. And if you watch movies like that, like people don't pay attention to this, but if you watch movies that do that, boom, 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 scene, 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 there's music playing the entire time. And that's to keep the pace of the film right. going. So there's not one scene where it's just quiet and people were talking, having a conversation. It's like, boom, background. There's like a little bit of music yeah. playing. There's this movie. A, this ton, playing. a ton of musical score, and it, yeah. Yeah, and it keeps the pace going and because they just want it like fast, 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 action, 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 like this, this, and this. And it's like, dude, slow it down. Let me feel something. Like if you want to start with some action and you want to start here and then slow it down, build some, like I, I don't feel connected to the characters. I don't feel connected to anybody. Oh, this person just died. I don't care. I, I don't I, care. Yeah, because you know? you're already numb. Um, yeah, to well, the pace. Like theater, you're not connecting to it. Well, in theater, we call it topping, right? Where like this, where you're you're leading up to a, a climatic series where the audience engaged and the, and the stakes get better. Um, the stakes get raised a little bit more mm -hmm. and a little bit more and a little bit more. But if you're in the beginning of the show where the stakes are here and they stay up there, um, there's and there's nowhere to top. We call it topping. Yeah. There's nowhere to go to. Um, that's 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 a fail. Yeah, well, I, I feel like that's why the Black Adam movie didn't do as well. Is, yeah. Because, I mean, the CGI, I amazing. I no. love Dwayne Johnson. I know. We, what's yeah. not to love? I was going yeah. to say, we have to, to, no, we have to cite as that as, um, we have to disclaimer that first, how yeah. we feel about Dwayne before, right? Yeah, we, no, Dwayne, and he, he killed it. And, like, him, him in a movie where he can just be a f tank badass who just f everyone up. I love that. That is dope. Yes. But then the pacing of that movie was just so fa And I even pointed mm. it out to Alex when we were... um watching the film is like there, i'm like dude there has not been one time during this movie where it's been silent yeah there's been a sound or a music soundtrack playing the entire time and i feel like that's why the movie didn't do as well like i still right. thought it was a dope movie like yeah he but, was people but they were missing they were missing the boat on 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 some of those things yeah it's, yeah but I, I hate that and then there was a uh, this other film mm. it was based off of a video game i can't remember what it's called but it's uh it was a monster hunter I think that's what it was. And the graphics were nuts, dude. These monsters were fucking crazy. <laughs> but the whole thing, movie was just boom, yeah. boom, boom, scene, scene, scene. And it's like, dude, I, I like lost because they think everyone's attention span is like this. So they're trying to sell to people who are just on TikTok scrolling around, like on like whatever. But it's like people who actually enjoy storylines. Like, uh, did you watch uh, The Woman King? That came out like, this last year? No, I didn't. Amazing movie. I got That movie that. was so my Should I do Wakanda Forever first? 
And is there a chronology there where I should, oh, I should no. see that first? No, the Woman King has is isn't Marvel. It's, it's like its own separate. Oh, yeah. So it has nothing to do with with, okay. with that at all. Um, so yeah, Woman King is just oh its God. own separate. But the storyline was so good. Like they started off with like all, like a lot of action, like all this stuff, and then they slowed it down and they built out this whole storyline for like the longest time. And it was just so cool. They had all these intricate relationships and all these other things that they've built and then it's built now you care about all these separate people mm-hmm. and then at the end they had this crazy like fighting scene again you know and it's it's like awesome that was perfect you wrapped it up great there wasn't some bullshit you know you didn't have like a really obvious endings and everything mm-hmm. like that and then in um uh and and then in all these other films it's just like boom 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 and it's yeah. like dude i don't care i don't care I think- if you see something like Avengers Endgame, mm. like those, like the the climatic the climatic series happened four or five times in the same movie, but it was so the timing was yeah. so appropriate. Like yeah, like um, you know, Cap Sam, can you hear me? There's yeah. no music. Dead Cap, Sam. Yeah, you know, on your left, you you want to cry. Yeah, and he comes out. The panther comes out there, and you start. I, I and then the music slowly. I, I comes feel like in. even talking about it now, yeah. as we speak, I'm feeling the rush yeah. right now. And then you hear the, uh, a, a small musical score that's not like, to, yeah. you know, just one thing. And then the panther, then this guy, then plus then Ibom, that's like years, the yeah. and that leads, and then the music builds up, and then Avengers silence. Yeah, assemble. What? Yeah, but it's just that's that's so much nostalgic bring up because because if you think about that was like movies and movies of of like build up and like even him saying on your left like that's a build up from from captain america movie when he was like years ago he's jogging yeah he kept passing him on your left yeah on your left he's like dude i'm trying to run here and i I say on my left one more time yeah i think i'm running (laughs) fast and then this then this super soldier keeps laughing yeah (laughs) so on your left was but then there was so beautifully done mm-hmm. in the what 10 plus years that they had that series from iron man all the yeah. way up to Endgame, and it was just so like they cared about it so much and all these other films are coming out with their f-ing garbage agreed dude because they're just cash grabs that yeah. new thor love and thunder movie was the worst movie it was aside, the worst out of all the thor movies aside from wonder woman 2 yeah like those are on par as like the worst movies i've ever seen and it's too bad because you look at the work um, Hemsworth, um, you know, Chris put in. Yeah. And, um, and he's a great actor. And who's who's the other girl? Um, Natalie Portman? Yeah, Natalie Portman. Yeah. yeah. They have a video called Natalie Portman Cries a Lot. It's a two-minute <laughs> video because she was a child actress. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Heat or Al Pacino, Rob De Niro. Oh, the, she's the little girl? Yes, that's Natalie Portman. Oh, yeah, but it was shit. Mom, baby, what's mom? So she cries, and they oh have this compilation God. movie called, uh, this compilation video on YouTube called Natalie Portman Cries a Lot. So guys, look that up. But it took, uh, she's found a character niche and a great story arc in her character, and that got severely taken away from this but terribly, her, her ri- terribly and... written, terribly directed script. Dude, Taika Waititi is the one who directed that in... He came out with like I don't remember exactly what he said, but he basically said like I'm giving with the the people what they didn't know they wanted. It's like no, we just don't f- want it. Yeah. And it was so bad. And then Chris Hemsworth said something like, "Yeah, I'm never gonna work with some genius director ever again." And then they fired Taika Waititi because that movie was so bad. Here you have, and like I can get into a whole Marvel rant. I f- love Marvel, but like Gore the God Butcher is like that's why we're here. Go ahead. Gore the God Butcher is one of the craziest MCU villains of all time. This dude is insane. This What's guy, it called? his name's Gore the God Butcher. He's yeah. the guy who's played by Christian Bale. Okay. So Gore the God Butcher in the comics is one of the scariest dudes of all time. Like this dude is this like uh, I mean he's an alien on not on his planet, but like he's he's on an alien planet like, right. with his race of people or whatever. In the and they uh, pray to gods. To like say that because there's no water, there's no food, whatever. The whole planet's dying, and they keep praying and praying. And he's like, "Yo, why should we keep praying to these people? They haven't gave us anything." So they kicked him out of the village, and so it's him and his daughter. So he's wandering through the desert, like, like you know, like basically saying like, like he's praying for the gods to mm-hmm. help, and there's no gods there. And then his daughter dies of that was it, yeah. yeah that his was daughter's this. dies, mm-hmm. and while he's in the desert, about to die, these two uh deities like fall down from the sky uh, it was either one or two it was like a yeah. god it was like a god like two gods like fighting like one of them's like evil one of them's good 
fall out of the sky and uh the there's like a sword that fell out of one of the guy's hands and it was uh, all black the necromancer which is like one of the most powerful swords in creation right and it's like literally created out of darkness like it's fucking crazy and the god goes give me like give me the sword like whatever like you know like and then like kill the bad guy or whatever like kill him and he's like help me he's like help me and then gore the god butcher was like when did you ever help me and then he kills the god with the all black necromancer sword just murks him and then he decides all gods must die so he goes he ends up using the sword and some other things and starts traveling yes through time uh-huh. and killing every god <laughs> every god he's going through and just murking everybody yes I, I, that was that was and and that that's character, terrifying. And that character, his story could have been told a lot. A, a, well, a dude, lot if you better. see the comic version of what Gore looked like, he yeah. was terrifying. And then you had Christian Bale with like white makeup on. <laughs> it shit looks so bad. It did. And at no point in that film, and what makes was, you, what makes anyone think that guy has a sense of humor? That character has a sense of humor. He yeah. doesn't. <laughs> yeah. And no, that character is literally hates all the gods. Yeah. None of them came for him. Wow. They laughed and mocked him as his whole people were dying and his daughter yes. dies. So mm-hmm. he's like, you know, what? I'm going to kill all the gods. There should be no gods determining the will of whether people should live or die. Mm-hmm. No one should determine that. So I'm going to kill every god. In the comics, because he was traveling through time, the way they Thor finally defeated him, it took Thor, old god king Thor, yep. and uh, Beta Ray Bill. Three Thors to yep. take him down. Yeah. And in this movie, no point ever. Right. Do you feel like Thor is in any danger? And he should have been in danger the moment that dude this guy, he's the moment that this guy declared war yeah, against he's, the gods. He's cracking jokes. He's being funny. Yeah. In no point do you feel like his life's in danger at all. And and listen. And Thor's the character in his defense. There was a level of being a Norse Thunder God where you felt like you could beat the world. But when danger is real and when it's in your face, we should have been able to see that. And I agree with you on that. Yeah. And there's something else you I want to feel it. Yes. Like when Thanos was coming, that was a build of several movies. And you just felt this. You like, saw him walk through a portal. You thought everyone was in trouble. Dude. Yeah. Like there, go, there, the goes, dude, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. And then you finally see him in Infinity War in the first like couple mm. minutes. And yeah. you're like, okay, because like before, all you've ever seen him is like he's in a chair, like uh-huh. he's not really talking, whatever. Has a few kind of dialogue, right. wordplay, and people just keep you just keep hearing the name Thanos, yeah. Thanos, Thanos. He's coming, he's coming, yeah. and you're like, well, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah, who? And then he shows up, mm-hmm. and just with his ship decimated the the people of Ragnarok. Yeah, I mean, not people of Ragnarok, people of uh, no, Asgard. Yeah. Asgard. So yeah. decimates the Asgardian ship, and. Also, before Kills that, he, he got the first... If people... Like, they don't tell the story of how he got the first stone. Yeah. Like Xander, right? He had to he pr- he had to eliminate that whole planet to get the power stone. So even before that, there was a story that was not told by Marvel. Maybe maybe they'll go back and do a retrospective thing. But he already had a stone, remember? Mm-hmm. Uh, where he's like, um, dread it, run from it. Um, destiny uh, comes all the same. And now it's here, or should I say I am? And he showed his fist. He already had one stone. Yeah, and when he eliminated Xandar, but you're right because his character was becoming more scary and scary as he got another stone on another yeah. stone, all the way to the end when he walked into Wakanda through a porthole. When he walked through that porthole, I just went, "Oh, jeez, man!" You know, they just fought like this huge battle, and now you got, <laughs> yeah, man. There goes, like I said, there goes the neighborhood. But yeah. get him finishing with what we said about Thor. It's no surprise that a director who already decided. He knows what's good for the people mm-hmm. uh, to be unable to do a character story on someone that says you're wrong. You don't know what's good for the people. Well, how, said how, wrong. No, but how can someone who already dictates, I'll tell you what the people like or not. How, how can you expect that guy to do a story arc on a character that goes against his personal philosophy? If the guy can't keep personal and professional separate. Dude, he, he's just so arrogant. Yeah, I mean, he, he had was, a job to do. He, well, he, he didn't, didn't do his job. He, he could have been yeah. arrogant and, and put that on the shelf and did his job. And it would have been an okay movie. Not great, yeah. but okay. And there was like no comic precedent for like a lot of the stuff he did. Like he just like decided to 
to, to direct it that way yeah. and like to choose the storyline yeah. and like everything. And then like at the very end mm -hmm. where Thor mm -hmm. empowers all the little kids with Thor power. He can just give anyone Thor. Why didn't he give all the Avengers Thor power when they were Could fighting that? Thanos? Yes. You know? That would have been nice. Yeah. Stick him in the chest with six freaking um, uh, Stormbreakers. Yes. Yeah. And another thing that's stupid is to reach the immortal end of the world, whatever deity that is, uh, time or whatever right. they okay. reached. Yeah. To reach him, all you needed was a the rainbow bridge? That's all you needed? Man. Thor can summon that with his hammer and the all bi you had the to, Bifrost, yeah, yeah. All you had to do to get the door open to this to Eternal was the Bifrost, which Thor has, and you can make any wish in the world. Come on. He couldn't have just pulled up and been like, yo, I wish that uh Thanos didn't win. Cool. Sure. <laughs> Bye. <Fucking dope. laughs> <laughs> that shit was so Snap my finger. Dude. And the reason why it was such an outlier, because until then, uh, the direction and the story arcs and the creation was uh, was absolutely... Dude, it was so good. Um, I grew up in X-Men then. Oh, me too. And, oh, in this studio, one one floor below the studio right now, mm -hmm. in, in, in a Harry Potter closet, um, I have 11 years worth of X-Men from 1983 what? From, to 1994. Every single issue for 11 what? years. I was an X-Head because... Um, well, I can get into the why in a minute, but I, I was an X-Men fan until I saw what the directors and producers did with Marvel, uh, with, um, the Avengers. And then, um, and then all of a sudden I find myself watching the X, uh, the Avengers repeated amounts of times instead of the X-Men shows. Mm -hmm. Like Dark Phoenix was, could have been just as bad as, as Love and Thunder, right? I mean, you get this chick from, from Game of Thrones, uh, oh, right? Yeah. The redhead girl, because yeah. I guess it's her turn. Uh, um, and, oh, with the new X-Men? Yeah, and yeah, one yeah, character yeah. can ruin it, ruin it for everybody else who puts so much hard work in. And I'm not saying she worked hard. I just think they saw red hair. They saw she's already an actress, Jean mm -hmm. Grey. And that was very that was a very lazy uh, uh, typecast yeah. uh, for the casting director. Yeah. You know, that ruined the whole new X-Men series for a whole bunch of people that could have been. Like the new Storm, I could have went with that one. The girl yeah. who's playing Storm, I, I can't dope. remember. Yeah. The guy who played Cyclops, I could have went with that. Yeah. yeah. And Hugh Jackman, maybe there is no replacement for Wolverine. Man, no maybe not ever. But the cool it. thing is because Wolverine, his healing factor, it's impossible to guess his age. You could use Hugh Jackman until he dies. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that that character's never miscast. Yeah. But Avengers was so good. I found myself paying more attention and reading back issues of Avengers and Amazing Spider-Man. And yeah. Thor, when I grew up, a total exit. But getting back to what we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, just real quick on yeah, that. Like, please. Uh, like, Hop and I have been talking about this. Like, we talked about this, like, recently. Like, or we talk about it quite a bit where mm. movies nowadays, especially like Marvel, they're getting to a point where they're, like, all these movies, like, they're bringing on actors who are already famous, like, really famous. Like, they just brought on, like, Harry Styles to the MCU and they brought on, um, What's his name? But they're they're bringing on people who are like really big actors. So like the same thing with like X Men with the Phoenix. They brought on didn't someone who's already famous. They didn't have to do that either. Yeah. But if you look at the Avengers, none of those people were famous before the Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. Like Robert Downey Jr. had a really successful career, and then he got into drug addiction. Yeah. And did a lot of terrible stuff, and he was literally back down to nobody and then they, they did iron man then he did because he was on his road back to, up did yeah. iron man chris hemsworth wasn't big chris evans was barely big like because this is all in the like early mid 2000s where none of these actors were big actors evans probably would have been as far as momentum was concerned he was already doing fantastic four right he so he yeah, got to play two marvel characters yeah but <laughs> <laughs> you know Handsome and, dude. Handsome dude. What do you want? Yeah. And then you got the whole like Deadpool, Green Lantern thing, you know. Yeah. But you're that. right. But but you have all these people who weren't big actors, but because of the MCU, they're now the biggest actors in the world. Yeah. And sometimes you just have but to they survive. they took them from the bottom and brought them up. It's like, do that with other actors. But sometimes you have to survive the big actors, too. Like, in the X-Men series, I followed it avidly, and I watched all of those movies multiple times. Yeah. And I thought the most the, the person that was the most miscast was Halle Berry. Halle Berry 
worked her behind off because she put in respect because she know kids read Mm X-Men and she's like wait this is a iconic character she's like wait I know what Christopher Reeves did for Superman I know what Michael Keaton did for Batman there's so many Batman and we're still talking Mm -hmm. about Keaton I know you know what this person did for that so I'm not saying she didn't work hard and I'm not saying she's one of the best she's not one of the best actresses the most attractive women on the planet but they could have went Angela Bassett Easily, yeah, a storm at that time. Because a little biased, because I loved Halle yeah. Berry. I do too. <laughs> as, no, but no, as Storm. No, but going in, I, that's Go, how going I felt. into. Oh, going, going into, out. Yeah. Going out. I, the worst thing I could say about Halle Berry is she she did the best she could. She did the best of her ability. If that's the worst thing you could say, that's pretty good because she's a good actress. And th- with that being said, I'm not saying the worst thing. The best mm-hmm. thing I'm saying was that worked out. Yeah. But, with, but with that being said, if you looked at the rest of the cast, Hugh Jackman, more known on the stage at the time mm-hmm. than than um the film, than film, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the girl to play Jean Grey, um, didn't really know her that well. Didn't uh, Magneto? Yeah, Magneto. Like, if you're doing comic book stories, you can go big star. Yeah, for bad guys. Mm-hmm. For bad guys, like Superman, Gene Hackman was a very popular actor back then. He played Lex Luthor. Batman, Jack Nicholson, so popular, he was the lead on, on the billing before mm-hmm. Keaton was. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Nicholson's name came up first. So when you watch these superhero movies, you know the um, you could get away with going star power with the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Because that's the most intriguing character. In some yeah, cases. Well, I mean, that's why I was so- Thanos, right? Josh Brolin. Yeah, that's why I was so worried about when they were going to reset the X-Men, when they had yeah, Ian McKellen as Magneto. Right. And it's like, there's no way you could have anyone else play it. And or then, Professor X for that matter, then, right? Yeah, but then they got Michael Fassbender and he, he destroyed murdered it, it dude. Savage! Now, I know. Now I'm like, Savage! I'm like, I don't want anyone else ever playing Magneto now. Like he needs to carry that until he's old Magneto. And just, oh my God, he did such a good job. And then even uh, um, James uh, uh, Mc, Mc, McRoy, whatever his yeah, name is. Yeah, McAvoy. Yeah, McAvoy, yeah. He killed it too. Like that ca- that now, younger casting was. Now, if I had to pick for Professor X's, I still go Patrick Stewart. But if I had to pick, yeah, but if I had Stewart. to pick for a Magneto's, I love me some Ian McKeon, but I got to go with Fastbender. Dude, Fastbender. Gnarly, is so gnarly f- Magneto. He's, he's a savage Magneto, dude. He's married. To the girl who did uh, the new Tomb Raider movie. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, she's wow. like, because I, because that's another movie where I f-ing loved Angelina Jolie as Tomb Raider. That was like my woman crush yes. as a kid. I watched it. Oh my gosh. She was so badass and a treasure hunter and all this stuff. So I was like, but is that you, what you associate her, her, her name with? Angelina Jolie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I was no, like, oh, because I was younger, you know, because yeah. like Angelina Jolie, but mm-hmm. that's what I associated her with was Tomb Raider because I loved those movies so much and she was just so cunning and badass and she was so perfect for that role. Mm-hmm. And then when they're like, yeah, we're doing a t- new Tomb Raider movie, I'm like, you can't, you can't, you can't do it. No. You can't replace her. And then, and then the new then girl they picked, sudden... she did such a good job and I was like, okay. And then I was like, is she single? And I like looked it up because I was like, damn, is she single? And then I was like, oh, of course, she's married to Michael Fassman. I'm like, I'll let nah, that one slide. Man. I was like, it's Michael Fassman. Dude. He's a legend. What's that girl? What's yeah. her name? I don't know. How'd you like to get murked by Magneto messing with his girl? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, Alicia Vikander. <laughs> That's who she is. Yeah, Vikander. Actually, I think she's someone. How you spell daughter. her name? Because I'm going to look it up. I'm going to put it up for everyone uh, to see. A L I C I A. Oh, okay. A L I C I A. Alicia. V I K A N D E E R. All right, let's take a look. Sweden. Now, now I didn't see the new Tomb Raider, so I gotta check out to see what this girl looks like. Whoa. Nice. You didn't watch the new Tomb Raider? I did not. Dude, she bodied it. She did a she really did. good job. All right, let's do this. Imagine what their kids are gonna look like. They're gonna have some good-looking kids. All right. It's, for some reason, there it is. I'm like, what's wrong with my? There it is. It's my Tomb Raider. Oh wow! Look at that. Type in a. T- let's see. Her is Tomb Raider. Like she, she fit it really well. Oh, type in Tomb Raider. Yeah. Boom. Let's do that. I got it. Yeah, she she fit the role. I got it. Here really it is. Here well. it is. It's like a totally different style. Um, yo. Of Tomb Raider. That's bad. Look at that. Yeah. She killed it. Dude. 
dude, look at that. Kills the bad guy. Saves the guy, the world, for, for, de for democracy. <laughs> and the, the thing I love about that movie is you have this, you always have this line between like magic, mythology, and like science. Mm -hmm. And it's like you have some movies where like, uh, like in the first Tomb Raider movie, there was a lot of magic right. that happened. And the thing I love that they wrote in this movie is there's magic, but it was a misplaced word for its time period. So then, because I don't, I'm not trying to ruin it for you. No, of course. So I'm trying to speak around that. No, because I might not even see it. So you yeah. just say it. <laughs> but uh, but they use what was this myth of like, oh, it's just a myth. Don't believe that shit. And then they realize, oh no, it's real, but it's based off this science thing. It's not a, it's not a magic thing. Like like okay, I'll, I'll spoil it. Spoilers, guys. Go ahead. If you haven't seen this Three, movie that's been two, out for like one four years, <laughs> bugger off. Um, yeah. So basically. There was this like, you know, tomb where they were trying to find uh, this like uh, this ancient tomb of this like weapon. OK. Right. This like ancient weapon because this lady would go around and she would like basically she could just touch somebody and they would die. And it was like they, they claimed that she had some kind of powerful weapon or whatever. And so uh, Alicia Vikander or like Lara Croft's dad died or like, went missing in the search for this. And so they're on this island. So she eventually ends up making it to the island. She's looking for her dad this whole time. Finds her dad. Finds the guy who, like, uh, tried to kill him because they were partners trying to find this. And then he's like, no, we can't open this tomb because we're going to release some evil into the world. Because her dad's like, no, like, this is great. Like, don't do it. And then she's even like, dude, there's no such thing as magic. There's no this, whatever. Like, it's fine if we just open the tomb. Let's just show them. So they go to open the tomb. And one of the guys like goes and uh, so they finally get down to the bottom of the tomb. There's all these guys and they're like, okay, grab her bones or whatever. And like, let's go, like, let's figure it out. So the guy like touches her bones and then he starts just f deteriorating in his whole body. And he like dies, like his whole, all of his skin like eats itself and it's he like dies. like the power stone. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, what the f And then they realize that this lady was a carrier for crazy disease. She was a carrier but she was uh, immune. Yeah. So she was going around. So, and so she was like a host. Yeah. So she yeah. would touch people and they would fucking just get instantly like deteriorate and die from this disease. So mm -hmm. this mythology, if she could touch people and they die and she had all this power and she was a witchcraft or whatever, all this is based on truth. Like, yes, she could do all that stuff, but it was cause she was a carrier to a disease. Wow. And so it was just like this. So the writing was just really good because they didn't touch what year did it come out? Oh, let's see. It was a couple of years ago. I'm hoping they have a new one soon. Yeah, she, dude, she was um, that was badass. The picture. Yeah, she twenty. Was, it was 2018. Like, it was like lean muscle, strong jaw, and a bow. <laughs> That's all you need all right. in life. <laughs> Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. Is there gonna be? An, there better be another yeah. one. I'm gonna be pissed. So let me ask you something. There are certain actors. Yes. It's going to be, oh wait, as of right now, There's actually look, nobody. What it look like? I should be plugging your computer. I should be plugging this. I should be plugging camera four into your thing. You're doing all the work for me right now. What? What, what, what? They said they're no longer doing a second one. Are you fucking kidding? Dude. They just, why do they keep fucking up my movies? They just did. They just did you in Dove. They did you in Dove. How are they going to do a movie that good? I'm so glad you showing the camera what your hat looks like. You got a Jurassic hat. Oh, I, oh, I told you. you I love Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, got a T-Rex. Look at it. I got a uh, X-Men. You do? Yeah, oh. on the side. Oh, my man. Dude. My man. 11, 11 Custom years. hat. <laughs> it was the best time period for the X-Titles, yeah. too. Storm, yeah, we, we, I, it's funny we talked about Jurassic Park but, and X Men. I but, forgot they were on man, my head. Man, what a great time though! Storm, Storm's relationship with Forge at the time. There was a guy named Forge. Oh, dude, I'm Kitty Pryde and Colossus. And oh yeah. Then Gambit with what Rogue and Psylocke and back to mm -hmm. Rogue. It was just. Mm -hmm. some, I mean, it was. Yeah, dude, Remy LeBeau is like one of the most underrated characters. Characters, yeah. yeah. Period. He's dope. I hope they do something for, uh, for him. I hope I hope this redhead didn't ruin it for all the X titles. I loved his yeah. little uh, Or the casting director didn't ruin yeah. it for all the X titles. I loved his little uh, mm -hmm. 
fight with um, Hugh Jackman mm. with Logan yeah. in like that um, or was it like the back alley scene yes. where they're fighting with the dude who could teleport? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Nightcrawler. Yeah. No, not Nightcrawler. It was no, the, the other one. Um, yeah, yeah. What's his name? Fuck, yeah, I right. Remember. Was he part of the Hellfire Club? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Red yeah, dude. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Bamf. 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 Remember? Remember that was mm-hmm. the, the words written. Bamf. Yeah. Bamf. <laughs> the teleport was Bamf. Bamf. So let me ask you something. There are certain actors, right, mm-hmm. where they're looking to play a certain character. Um, that makes people associate their face with that character forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christopher Reeves, Shakespeare trained actor, probably did. Mac- I'm sure at some point did Mac- Macbeth, Hamlet, and did all all, mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff like that. Did Superman? That's the one thing that I remember his face by. Hugh Jackman. I mean, he's been in a ton of you know Phantom, you know whatever, and a ton of romantic comedies, and mm-hmm. and he's a very capable actor, and, and still still quite a, quite the hunk. We only remember him as Wolverine. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'm I, okay if I only ever remember him. <laughs> no, but the, here's the cool thing. How many actors play a part like that and still survive and, and their career still survives? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You don't. Yeah. You don't need to wear I that. Know, I'm I told you. I told I you know, I had to wear it. It's boiling in here, boy. <laughs> but, um, all right, so Christopher Reeves. Mm-hmm. I don't really remember anything he's been in. Christopher um, Reeves? Yeah, Superman. He oh, wound yeah. up crippled and paralyzed and from the neck down. Yeah, I, and I, so know, I know. Superman. Well, that's what that song... Uh, Superman got crippled, yeah. That's doing it. the song that was written about him? Yeah. Um, uh, how's, I'm trying to think of how it goes. Like, mm. um, Oh, yeah, I'm more than a bird. More That's than it. a plane, more than some pretty face, out of chain. It's not That's easy. It. That song's about Christopher Reeves. Wow. Didn't it's not about that. Superman, but because it's talking about like I'm more than this and more than that. Yes. It, was like, it was like when he was dying of, of cancer. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that song's written about not him being Superman, but him being Christopher Reeves, like saying he's more than just Superman. And like, dude, so if you listen to that song, like keeping that in mind that it's about Christopher Reeves, it's a beautiful song. I think I'm. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have I to go take to a listen to it. To listen to that, to yeah, you should. It today, it's man, because yeah. then all the all the lyrics change now because uh-huh. you're like you know now it's about Christopher Reeves. Oh, dude, that song is so good. But I, I think the point the the broader point I was trying to make in Christopher Reeves is actually the standard bearer for this um, subject matter. Mm-hmm. There are very few actors that do something like that and they still their career arc. Uh, is still steady or going up, mm-hmm. right? Jackman, he did Phantom, and he's an example of a guy. Oh, I, well, you know what? Cool. I did a character everyone's gonna remember for the rest of their life, and survived, and still, ha- and still, you know, and still went on to do other things. You know, like Christopher Reeves is pretty much done after that, yeah. as far as star power. Michael Keaton, you know, he's done some. He's done the paper, and he's he's done really good bad guy roles. Um, and I think he was nominated for best actor for some. Yeah, well, some Mike, movie, Michael Keaton of, is just known now as just. Yeah overall being a, a you know fabulous fabulous actor you know yeah, of, of course Halle Berry of course she su- she survived Storm I mean because because I think she had she had star power before Storm so that's different yeah Halle Berry I mean I'm, I remember even the B movies like Strictly Business with, with she was Tom she Davidson. was a uh, Catwoman yes too remember yes. that <laughs> she was also in um Jungle Fever she was um Sam Jackson was a crack addict and he was a crack addict's girlfriend. It was her first role. Mm. She's screaming, eat me, eat me. You know, she's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't um, she? She, she she's was in Daredevil in, too, right? Uh, did, did she play Catwoman in Daredevil? With uh, Do you know. remember Daredevil with Ben Affleck? I do. But I don't yeah. remember. Uh, I mean, that was forgettable character. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I don't as, as, is his I ba- know. as is his Batman. Sorry. I'm, I'm Batman. I, I liked the old Daredevil though. It's just, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Charlie, Charlie Cox daredevil right now is like amazing that's, that's why people love about. him see i typed in this shit and i get a bunch of photos of charlie cox <laughs> who is the female in that yeah we um, gotta check that out karen page oh is electra and it was jennifer garner <laughs> yeah she played electra in that wow i totally forgot about that oh my god dude 
You know, it's crazy. So, man, I got I got to rewatch this. Like you always think of like West Virginia is like a fat girl state, but like all the hottest actresses came from West are from West Virginia. Is that where she's from? Yeah. 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 Jennifer Garner. Yep. She's in West um, Virginia. Electra. Yeah, 2005. I got a hottie oh, for a, yeah, I got a dude. hottie for a wife who's from West Virginia. Mm-hmm. It was shit. Let me see. She was so fire in that. Oh my god, let me put it up for everybody. We we got an audience. We we have an audience we owe this to. So I'm gonna just put in Jennifer Garner, Electra. Fire. Nice. Let's go images. All right, people, you waited. You waited. So now we're gonna show you. Oh, oh, good, good lord! <laughs> wow. Oof, man. This Dude, is, I think, this isn't even like woman territory. This is like goddess. This is like something less than a god, but more than a woman. You Dude, know? if you want to see, like, probably like Yo. one of the hottest scenes of all time ever, from played by an actress. Have you seen From Dust Till Dawn with yes. George Clooney? Yes. Selma Hayek. Selma Hayek. And Dust Till Dawn. Dust Till Dawn. Pull up the image right now. Oh, my God. Pull we it up. Do that. Yes. Selma Hayek. The craziest scene I've ever... Where she comes out with the, the python on her shoulders. Yeah. Selma Hayek. She was yeah. good. Yeah. Python from Dust Till And she's still hot. And she's like, she how old is she now? And she's still in a... She was just in that uh, movie with uh, Samuel Jackson where he played Kincaid. Um, uh, Bodyguard's Wife or something like that. Okay. The Bodyguard. Dust till dawn. And, uh, who, who's, who else is in that? I don't know, but Chris Pine, Chris Pratt. I actually Chris, liked her. One of the Chris's. As far as like attractive, uh, um, Selma Hikes is yeah. concerned, I liked her in uh, Desperado with Antonio Banderas. But here we go. Yeah, pull up. Oh, see, boy, we're gonna get, we getting, we gonna get in trouble for this. Look at this. Just the craziest wow. scene. Where she came out with the like snake on her. Yes. <laughs> I remember Dust Till she Dawn and everybody, wild, for everyone who's never seen Dust Till Dawn, it just seemed like a normal place. They go into a party. Everyone's having a good time. And then when the clock strikes midnight, right, everyone's a vampire. And, yeah. And, and like, yeah. and they're like, wait a second. There's only like six regular people in here. And, and we're, we're dinner. We're like a feast for these people. Yeah. We got to get the hell and out of here. she's so hot. Dude, she's 56. Yeah. That's 56. I know. She's 50. And she's still hot. Yes. She that is insane. She drank, she Born drank, in 66. She when did Dust Till Dawn come out? 96. Hold on, wait. How You said 56 or 66? She's 56 right okay. now. But she was born in 66. Okay. Dust to Dawn came out in 96. So she was 30 in that film. Okay, but still not hot she's, now. Like in the movie with Sam Jackson, right? Yeah. She's still mm-hmm. hot. Like, <laughs> it's stupid. This is her 56, dude. Oh, my God. That's awesome. There's no way. Hold on, go back to it. Yeah. I'm going to just put this on camera. Check it out. Let's do that. I want to see that. Summer Hike. That's her. 56. 56 years Stupid. old. Stupid. That's crazy. So, you so again, very interesting conversation about like certain actors who have to survive their success. Mm-hmm. Right? Because it's the one thing you're looking for your whole career. I want to play this role that people will, that will last long after all of us are dead. And then when you get what you want, you got to want what you get because yeah. is it all like from music? Cause music's you more, more your wheelhouse, even though we dabble in other things speaking in your wheelhouse, turning back the clock when the Eagles did the album hotel, California, mm. they're like, we're in deep. Shit. Yeah. We're in deep trouble. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> it's one of the best albums ever. And they're just like, how do we beat that? <laughs> there was almost an uh, um, because it was such a a, a highly aware, like mm-hmm. so, a socially aware group of people, yeah. and what people thought and this and that, and, and they had a good pulse on on that. They knew there, they knew that was the the beginning. They knew that was the beginning of the end. But see, then people in like my generation, mm-hmm. like I grew up listening to the Eagles all the time because my dad was a huge Eagles fan. Yeah, so I grew up listening to their music all the time. And I just know them for making good music Mm -hmm. because I wasn't there for their rise and fall. I know. I was just there growing up like, wow, their music's amazing. That's all I know. But that's what I was talking about. The album that made that, that, that that lasts long long after their name, you know, 
and that's what that's what we, us that's what we artists i'm not a we you know we know more i'm a volleyball coach yeah. but that's what you artists really want you strive for that and if or when you get what you want you gotta want what you got you gotta get yeah. it you gotta take what comes with it after that or maybe you just hit that part and you might drop it and move on to the next evolution. You <laughs> yeah. know, whether it's still within your wheelhouse or not within your wheelhouse. But as far as favorite Eagle songs go, I go Wasted Time. Mm. And you've heard me sing it too. I you've, have heard you've you heard sing. me sing yeah, Wasted I Time. I have heard you sing it. Um, Desperado is a lot Take of people's it easy. favorite. Take yeah. it easy. Oh my God. Oh, dude, that song just Take puts me in like a just a chill mood. Like, like driving down the road, like the highway. Yes. Because uh, there was a uh, whenever I used to drive to college, it was just like all because like Washington is a lot of mountains, but there's a drive like the east side of Washington. There's a, it's like there's a lot of really flat lands, so I would just be on this highway like this endless highway. It's like straight the whole way, and it was just like no mountains, just like one highway. And I would just play the Eagles. I'd play. Uh, uh, like ACDC, I'd play. And just all this music where I'm just like vibing. Like uh, Jim Croce, love Jim Croce. Yeah. Well, Fleetwood Mac was a lot of one of my favorite road songs. Like Stevie Nicks. Oh, and yeah. Stevie um, Nicks, great. Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you Can Never Break the Chain. Uh, listen to the can wind never blow. break the chain. Yes. Yes, and you don't know, love me now. You might never, never love, love me you. again. Wow. And I still you actually, you had the right octave. <laughs> See what I mean? This is why you better. You had it right the first time. <laughs> um, Gold Dust Woman, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Did she make you cry? Make you break down? Shatter your illusions of love. Is it over That's now? Crazy. Do you know how? Pick up the pieces and go home. I, th I think that I think I want to be a big enough artist where everyone knows my songs. But then, like, later down the road, they're like, yo, Dive, that was this song and this song. Like, he did this song. He did this song. Yeah. And, like, uh, I know I know a lot of people, like, Drake has a lot of haters. But if you go through, like, Drake's hits and his albums, mm -hmm. he's got, f like, hundreds of songs that they're all really good songs and nostalgic songs. You, like, grew up listening to or I grew up listening to him. Mm -hmm. And, like, I go through so many of his albums and I'm like. There's no way this dude made this many hits. I don't know what the term for music for shape shifting is, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can be transcendent, meaning that it goes be that people listen to the music beyond your genre, like yeah. if you could be transcendent and at the same time chronologically, um, I'm, I'm gonna be redundant, chronologically sustainable. Yeah. Um, Drake is that guy. Drake's that Drake is that guy. A Madonna was that person. She went from mm -hmm. like a virgin to Lies La Bonita to like a prayer to um justify my love she trends when the 80s changed when 80s pop changed mm -hmm. she changed and when 90s pop changed she changed that's like two debt two and a half decades of yeah of you know well then then you have someone like taylor swift who starts off as like a this like broken hearted country singer yeah and now she's making this like huge pop records yeah. and Doing you know, really well. When I want to feel good about myself, I take a Taylor Swift record and I play it backwards. <laughs> play it backwards. I get all my, I get my job back. I get my lover. I get my car back. My dog, yeah. my dog's alive. You just take that. that, take that record and you play it backwards. Yeah. Well, basically any country music song. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about, I wanted to save enough time to talk about certain beats that you like to get your freestyle on. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite beats, and I'm and I'm citing, I'm just saying this right. Now. I ain't no freestyle. This is something I do on my own when there's not a person within a hundred yards of listening to me. Because mm -hmm. I ain't trying to sound like no fool, but I could sound like plenty of fool by myself with nobody listening. I like shook ones, mob okay. deep, mob deep. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think I, I I mean I ain't trying to make everything about Eminem, but I think that was um the song he did at the end for Eight Mile, right? The freestyle. Yeah, it Everybody was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, one, three. Yeah. So I like that one. His real um, name is Clarence. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Clarence lived at home with his parents. Yeah. <laughs> Someone did a video of uh, Ja, Ja Morant like that. Oh, they, really? They changed ja the words. Morant. They changed the words. I know something about you. You went to Cranbrook instead of it was his school. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a private school. And yeah. then they showed a picture of him living, living with his parents in a perfectly great marriage. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy didn't want to battle. He shook because they know such things as... Everyone in the crowd yells, halfway yeah. 
sucks. Yeah. Because the time setting that uh, that was 1995 and half and um shook ones. Yeah, that's was, the year I was born. Shook ones was a, that was that was the jam back then. Yeah. You know. Mob D, yeah, Mob D was yeah. dope. like they had the craziest beats. Almost all, yeah, like yeah. Um, I don't did, they survival they of the fittest. Did they didn't produce their beats? Did they? No, I don't. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Most most groups back then until ninety five had, had, had a DJ that yeah, they had a uh, DJ. actually their own DJ that was like yeah. KRS one. Yeah. He had Scott LaRock. Well, they who, Scott LaRock them. died. Yeah, but then yeah. Kenny Parker, uh, from the Bronx, uh, was yeah. He's that's like Kenny. Like what, that's yeah. what Dre did, you know, he'd be there like mixing and but doing you can, everything live. And, and the reason why stealing beats is okay because you can only do so many before <laughs> it doesn't start. Eventually, it's, eventually you're gonna you're gonna have something in your score that's gonna sound like everybody else's. Eventually, yeah, you know, especially and, when you're in subgenres and yes. like you're doing the same subgenre genre as someone. It's like, like in the '80s, you could come up with new beats because it was easier. Yeah, like Kenny Parker. I remember Boogie Down Productions. KRS is one of my favorite rap artists of mm -hmm. all time. And he's in between songs like, yo, Kenny, where'd you get that beat from? He's like, you know, I made it up. <laughs> you know, I just made this up right now. And, it, and that was believable. But yeah. but there's nothing. And I hate to, I know we come full circle in this conversation. There's nothing better in the world than taking a beat and looping it. Like, um, Karis had this song called Step Into a World, where it's Blondie. Mm -hmm. uh, remember the song Blondie yeah, Rapture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Step into a world mm -hmm. where there's no one there. <laughs> But the very yeah. best. Didn't uh, no MC contest. Didn't uh yes yes yo. Kanye also remix that at one point. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> Jesus walks is a great original though. Oh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you ever see the video where he played that for yes. his his uh, uh for the label that he was producing for? And he walked out of the room, and the, someone still had a camera going, and they all started laughing. Yes. They're like, yo, this is going to be so trash, whatever. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> triple platinum. Yes. <laughs> like, blew up. Was the video on a plane? Because they had another video. He was doing it on a plane. And, like, oh, Jesus up, what? so many other artists well, were, he, he went were around flying first class. And so many time. of the artists are like, do, do, do. And then there were women like, hoo, 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 Oh, no, 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 no. What that was Ooh, what was, was that? Uh, he was... Um, he was going to do a show and he flew his uh he flew his whole choir out uh -huh. and then they were practicing rehearsing it on the plane so that was his whole choir that he brought and that wow. might have been that might have been for uh because that was that was more recently and that might have been when he first started doing his uh sunday service like five six years ago or something like that yep. yeah i think that i think that's what the first video was it was like he, he he was flying the choir out to what like ohio or wherever he's got that mm -hmm. that like a farm yes yeah yeah so he's <laughs> jesus there's always a farm <laughs> yeah there's always, there's a, always farm. a neverland ranch <laughs> yeah there's always a ranch <laughs> there's always some kanye what, what are you doing bro we're gonna talk about him in a minute but yeah. i'll give you another example um musical score right mm -hmm. um you ever heard of five rule of the world by nas yes yeah. right so mm -hmm. the beat that's from the song friends houdini 1983 and if I rule the world it was from a different, a completely different artist. But that's what I'm saying. So, All beats were so like the chorus off from beats. one artist, the beat from Houdini yeah. and Nas. If I rule the world and everything in it, sky's the limit. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of artists who like. Uh, oh, um, fuck. What's his name? The dude who just recently died. Um, Shaggy. Yeah. His Shaggy died. Yeah, didn't he? No, 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 stop that. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> yeah, he died. I can't believe that. Yeah, by uh How did Shaggy by, go Killed out? by a celebrity death hoax. Shaggy, oh, okay. I'm not dead. Okay. Shaggy's not dead. He's not dead. Thank God. But yeah, that, okay. You're getting that Sam and, Simon Cowell. We're getting the same thing. Simon Cowell passed away celebrity hoax. And Jackie Chan, pretty much well, every chance you get. Who was it? Maybe it wasn't Shaggy. Who am I thinking of? Um, Who did the... um. Um, you know the DMX. Sassy in a bedroom. It wasn't who, who did Oh, it? that's that's Shaggy. That is Shaggy. Yeah, it wasn't me. I hope they paying him residuals for that commercial. 
Yeah, I hope Shag. I hope Shaggy's a millionaire from that commercial. They have. Um, it wasn't me. But I think it's a credit card commercial. Uh huh. Like, <laughs> like you charge us to your card. It wasn't me. You ain't, ain't got to pay for it. Okay. Ew. Um, it wasn't me. Dude. Now Shaggy. I educated my audience while while MC Dav here is doomed. He's he's teching my show for me. <laughs> now Shaggy ah, was man, for some of you guys that appreciated Shaggy. dance hall reggae, Shaggy did big up. So you could big up, big up. Hard at home and say me big up, big mm -hmm. up. Um so many so he's been he's been around for a minute. Like Big Up came yeah. out in ninety or ninety one. So Shaggy, that's you know, um, I have no idea how old he is, but he was getting it in back then. And then it's a song. It wasn't me. Oh, it, okay, it wasn't. It's a song similar to like it wasn't me. It's like it's like that kind of caliber of artist and style. And I'm trying to think, but I remember like the whole hook it's, yeah. is someone else's song, and even like the beat is someone else's song. And I'm trying to remember who it was. It's gonna bug the shit out of me. I'm gonna think of it like a couple hours later. I'm gonna text you and be like, "Yo, this is the song." All right, let's go to, um, why yeah, are we thinking about on, that? Let's, let's go to Ye. Okay. Is Ye misunderstood? Rhetorical question almost. I would say severely misunderstood. I feel like he was misunderstood. In the last like year or two, he's, he's just fully snapped. Yeah. I mean, did you see that interview with him? About the Nazi thing? About like Hitler's cool, like uh, like uh, not that no. one, but the one where he's like bringing out puppets and like imitating voices. Yeah. And, no, dude. <laughs> I think in that moment I was like, I think no. something snapped. Because I still love Kanye's music. Like I still love Kanye. Like he was a huge influence on my music. And Life of Pablo, I will fight that. That's my fate. That's my favorite album that he's ever done. His life of Pablo. Look, did the you, thing did that you popped find up. It? No, look, okay. it's an interview with Alex Jones. We ain't showing that. Yeah, if that's <laughs> the one. Dude, no, no, no. In that interview, Alex Jones is the chill one. Alex Jones is the voice of Sandy. Yes. He's like, yo, well, look, look, we, all, denounce, look, we all denounce Nazis, right? Where I, Basically, we, we got to say that up front. And he's like, no, but Nazis, they, they had good ideas. And Alex Jones is like, well, all right, count me out, you know? <laughs> I actually count do a good Alex Jones, by the way. Kanye uh, puppets. Yeah, dude, we ain't we ain't playing that. <laughs> We're gonna look at it later, but um, no, we, we could give a summation. It's just like a Let's one give a minute summation clip. To, um, yeah, I got a one minute clip here. Kanye's verse on the puppet. It's a one minute forty six thing right here. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Dude, just just do the put. Just click the puppet. <laughs> now I like. Like a lot of people don't like Alex Jones because they think like some of the things he says is harmful. Mm -hmm. I like Alex Jones because I don't take him seriously. If you can see someone like that and accept it as, as satire, right? Yeah. Like the dude is so outrageous and like no human beings like that, that you have to laugh, then um, you could take it as entertainment value. But um, I'm not fine this shit. I mean, I'm not getting like life advice from alex jones i think i think the reason why people think alex jones is hurting people because they think there's an, enough people out there that are dumb enough to get life advice social and medical advice from alex jones you stupid you know you shouldn't even take medical advice from bill gates you know so yeah, i right, mean yeah, right that that dude's okay because he's likable so well, dude, you shouldn't even get medical advice from the people who are running uh the health <laughs> right? department because dude you look at them they're all overweight and not in like healthy and they're gonna give me health advice of what I should be eating and how I should be working out. But do you, you appreciate you why me? medications and vaccines uh, uh, were recommended? Why their argument is strong? Because they generally don't trust the the public that has the general public that has an obesity issue to, you know, what I'm saying, do vitamin D, mm -hmm. live a healthy lifestyle, and do all of those things. So. So uh, there is an argument to be made for it because of the general mistrust of people to be able to take care of themselves, yeah. you know, and, and it does suck. You're right. You don't want, I don't want diet advice from an overweight heifer. Yeah. Right? I don't want, um, a hair gel advice from Joe Rogan. 
Right. Look, if it comes up in a conversation uh, and, yeah, and, and he's like, talking about a friend. I mean, if he's saying like what not to do, it's yeah. like, okay, I'll listen yeah. to you. But I do like, no, I do like oh, conversation. I found the video. Please. Tell okay. me, what, what's the name of the video? Because I could keyword it. Well, it's just on Twitter. It's on it Twitter? Kanye lost. Kanye West has lost his fucking mind. I'm going to tweet it. To you. Are you on Twitter? Yeah, yeah I'm on Actually, Twitter. I'm just going to text you the link. Te- yeah, text me the link. I could do that. And we could look at the picture on this, but I but I don't podcast. I watched that shit and I was like, I'm like man, there something is. happened there. Let's see. Let's put it on. And I know, I know they put him on medication for so long, so it's like I think it's the medication that did that. I, yeah, it, of course it is. He's been on medication for like decades. Yeah, and like a lot, and they keep putting him on and taking him off. Right, like, that is. messes with your body chemical. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know. He's trying to get across and like what he's what he's saying, dad. but it's like the delivery and like the way he did it. I'm like, dude, he just sounds like way off the rocker, yeah. and like, and I love Kanye. What? His... But all the stuff he's been doing lately is just like. And then did you watch the interview with him and Lex Friedman? Yeah, I did. Oh, that was heavy. tough to watch, dude. That, that was, was tough to. And like Lex Friedman is such a level-headed, like really calm, and he's like, and he likes to put himself in a position where. He doesn't like he tries to view things from other like people's if he was in his shoes, how would he react? Yeah. yeah. And so he so that's why he you don't see him like react to stuff because he it's like these are just words coming in. He's like trying to figure out what exactly they mean. But some of the stuff Kanye was saying on that, it just was so bad. I know. And like like in Lex Freeman was like, it's like what when, when Kanye was like, oh, yeah, you know, like um these people, like, I don't want to actually say it because I don't want your thing to get flagged. Of course. But, like, so, like, we know we're talking about, like, this these type of people. He's like, oh, yeah, they're the bad people, whatever, da, da. Like, they're doing this and this. And Lex Freeman's like, okay, well, let's not call them by that name. Call them by individual names because everyone's an individual person. Right. So if there's a problem with the industry, call people out by their name for who they don't call out an entire race of people for doing something that you just happen to have a couple of those people. He's like, if you want to solve the, and then Kanye's like, Oh, well, like, how would you do it? How would you do it? Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, as a, uh, he's like, you're an engineer. You, cause he kept bringing up that Lex is an engineer. He's like, well, as an engineer, I would just build something better. He's like, why don't you build a label that doesn't have people suppressing artists and taking their masters and taking this? Like, and he is in that position. Yeah. Like, dude, you're multi-billionaire. It's not like he has to work with them. no, yeah and but he kept trying to make it a point and, and lex is like i get it they all happen to be of those of that people but like they don't represent an entire people they don't like he's like just call them out by name mm-hmm. and get those people who are totally screwing over artists because they are in indiv- everyone's an individual right and like, here's here's the thing if you let's say someone has a problem with israel Mm-hmm. Israel's not an ethnicity. Israel's not a religion. Israel's a nation. Yeah. And if they have policies that that are are consistent with an apartheid state, I think you are exempt from anti-Semitism because you're not talking about you're not trying to out uh, 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 an ethnicity or a race, which is weird because Judaism is is in this world is considered both. Well, it's, yeah, you know, it's and because well, and, and, you can and they're protected under both. But yeah. but. You can have a problem with Israel and have zero problem with, with Judaism as a religion or, or Jew, Jewish people as a race. Mm-hmm. When Kanye is taking these 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 promoters, because I guess the record sales and, and, and the music industry, like as far as the brass, is very Jewish dominated, right? So so if you take the behavior of, like you said, some people who are exploiting them, someone who's stealing from them, someone who's just like using them up and throwing them away and saying like, all of these, like you said, you know, and that's in that context, I'm gonna skip it too because we ain't trying to get flat. But if you're taking all of these people and saying they're all doing it, there's, there's like you said, it's disingenuous and is, and is unfair. And Lex Friedman, and, and I'm echoing what you're saying mm-hmm. because I want I wanted to hammer home for our audience. Friedman is a great suggestion. You are in the you're the one of the handful of guys that's in a position to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Don't go on Twitter and say I'm about to go DefCon three on these guys. Just yeah. say, hey, guess what? These guys, there's a handful of guys that are doing this, and I got a plan, and I have an army. Yeah, because he really did. Yeah, he, he he still has an army. He lost a, a large percent of his army, but if he played his cards right, well, his I arm, that army. Well, he could have built a label, 
that I mean what they had good music but like he didn't own that his name was just on it like right. other people ran it but he okay. could as Kanye West created his own label he built it he could have went yay and still got yeah what he, he he could have prom- he could have like built what he was preaching that he wants to see he could have built that mm-hmm. and then everyone else call him out by name like these are you know people who are mistreating artists and who are taking their money and doing this like don't sign with them do whatever da 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 and then almost like grant him like like amnesty over to his <laughs> label you know like take other artists under his wing i mean he doesn't have to do anything but like if you're gonna if he's gonna go on a tirade like that like you got to do something. You don't just right. start yelling at people online and the bright blaming an entire group of people. And like, that's, that's always been the issue is like people blame groups of people instead of people as individuals. We, and I'm, I was sad about it because sorry, my mic, <clears throat> that's better. Mm-hmm. We desperately needed someone like Ye who has a voice that couldn't be canceled to do the right thing on this one. Ye yeah. highlight of the problem. That's an ongoing problem. That's a residual problem. All the way trace it all the way back to NWA. If you ever saw mm-hmm. Straight Outta Compton, which was based based largely on most most yeah. most, most real events, um, Ice Cube. That song Ice Cube never got canceled because he did it right. Yeah. That song No Vaseline mm-hmm. or Be True to the Game. You can't be a an, a like a for life crew with a white dude telling you what to do, right? So um, never got canceled. Horny yeah. the, the song Horny Little Devil. Yeah. Right. The, uh, about Koreans and uh, and about sexual harassment from a white a certain type of white person, and and also Koreans following black people, you know, through the store like they're gonna steal something. You know, these these were real issues that, if you do it right, you give the voice to the voiceless. Because we, I don't have one, right? Like if last year, if I. St- Hypothetically, if I stick up for Joe Rogan and if I if I go on social network and talk about what's what's fair and what's not on Facebook, mm-hmm. and Facebook flags me, says I violated community guidelines, who has my back? Does Rogan have my back? No, right? Does does Kanye? No. So the the part that disappoints me is that he has a platform that that's not cancelable, and if he did it right, he could have given a voice to people. Who are willing to follow him because he feels like everyone everyone has each other's back, mm-hmm. right? Look at January six, right? Look at like the crazy those crazy Republicans that thought the election was stolen. This yeah. and that. they went there because they thought Trump had their back. Trump didn't have their back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they went to jail, and yeah. and right now a federal judge is handing out jail sentences like like playing cards like blackjack Mm -hmm. hit me bam one another one hit me bam (laughs) one another one hit me bam so the reason why i'm upset at him is because it was a huge teaching moment to show people how to stand up for themselves and and survive it Mm -hmm. because in order for us to have a revolution in order order for us to have collective change speaking only in our wheelhouse not politics but like music and this and that there's no one person ordinary person that can do it it would yeah. have to be a collective change from many ordinary people or one megastar savage. Well, I mean, the the problem that, like, when, when Kanye is talking about a whole group of people, right? You're you now have a lot of people who are ignorant to maybe no one's ever met mm-hmm. a Jewish person, right? So now you have like someone who maybe maybe Kanye is a figure to them and like he he has a lot of people who like look up to him so now he's saying like hey this whole group of people are bad people and uh, are you familiar with daryl davis i am so he black man musician who infiltrated the ku klux klan and he convinced a lot of those people to leave the klan but he, he wrote a whole book about it and he would talk to these people and they would say He'd be like, okay, so like, why? And they're like, oh, well, black people are like, like physiologic, physiologically, they are more aggressive based on this part of their brain where they do right. this, so they're this and that, because they were told that and they, they were ignorant to it. And he's like, okay, so we're more aggressive. He's, they're like, yeah. He's like, have okay. He's like, can you name one black serial killer? They're all white. <laughs> There's not one black serial killer. He's like it doesn't make sense, and he. Do you, do you see my wheels turning right now? And he, the whole time you're yeah. talking, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna get him. I might get him with the one. I still can't yeah. come up with the one. And and all he did was come in with an open mind. He didn't hate these people mm-hmm. for hating him based on the color of his skin. Like he couldn't. He came in with an open mind. Like you guys are just, you just don't have the knowledge 
of like the truth. Like, like you're being fed lies and he came in and convinced a lot of clan members to no longer be racist and like no longer hate. I know that dude, Daryl Davis. People. Yeah. And he they have a video of him in a barbecue with the KKK. Listening probably. to country music. Yeah. Because like you said, he infiltrated and and then he started convincing people that like no, you're wrong. like your views on mm. it are wrong. So when someone like Kanye talks on a whole group, entire group of people, he's now putting, it's a similar idea where now right. he's putting that idea into people's heads who are ignorant to that group of people. And they're like, oh, well, these people are this. They are greedy. They are this. They are bad people. And you can't do that because right. you had, and that's why like, I like Lex's emphasis on speaking on people as individuals because everyone's an individual. You might, sure you might, have certain tendencies from like where you grew up and like your cultural background, but that shouldn't determine who you are as a person. So your weight of a person should be measured on your own actions as an individual person and not as an entire group of people. Cause now everyone's going to be ignorant to a certain group of people, which is, which is bad. Like you don't want to like people, like you should view people like individually. Cause like you could say the same thing, like, Oh, every white person who grew up in the South is racist. Right. You're talking about something big, but I want to point out something in the middle of that. This is the reason why you're sociologically and politically homeless. You, um, because if you were not sociologically and politically homeless, I would be able to listen to some of the things you're saying and be like, okay, he's that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, he's far, he's moderate, right. Or he's, he's, um, he's a bleeding heart liberal or he's kind of mid, mid, whatever you are political homeless because the, it, those people are types of people where you're not talking about types of people. You're mm -hmm. talking about individual be human, human behavior that shows reflections of different types of people. And that is hugely, hugely important, which gets to my, my broader point, um, mm -hmm. what we were talking about. Empathy and the power of forgiveness and understanding of people. The question I was going to shape, because that was part of one of our subjects, that you naturally and organically just mm -hmm. uh, drove, drove us <laughs> the right direction because I could drive us off the cliff the power of forgiveness and empathy the, the question was can we come back and you said we it, um, and I think you're answering that I'm not talking about a category of people that are so far gone that if you're KKK and you see a black person all you see is red and, and that's all you can see some of those people it's really really hard for them to come back and I'm not talking about that kind of person I'm talking about people who believe they're right based on the information that they're armed with. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have to forgive people. Because if I was armed, if I, I'm half black, half white, mm -hmm. but my fear was if I was born all black and no white and not white, I would hate white people. Growing up, growing up on Flappish Avenue, seeing what the police did and this yeah. and that, if I were armed with only the information that I had, that's the that shapes my individual behavior. And, yeah. and, and I would... I would love someone out there to forgive me for that, <laughs> you know, and, and empathy, Chappelle said this both ways. Empathy is not um, transgender or gay. It's bisexual. Well, it's, it must, it it's must work both ways, you know, and uh, like a lot of people, like when they grow up, the reason that they believe a lot of things they do is because of the people that they grow up around and their families that grow up around because it, it goes back to our like instinctive tribalism mm -hmm. that we have where we have to be a part of the tribe to survive because back in the day, if you couldn't fit in, you had to be on your own and you didn't likely die. But if you could, if you could fit in with everyone else around you, then you'd survive. Right. And that part of your brain was developed in the earliest parts of your brain and development, which is part of the amygdala, which is like binary. So right. like, it doesn't know the difference between, fitting in to survive in a in a 2023 20, cultural setting to a fitting in to survive in in a cave with a couple other families you know like it doesn't know the difference show them the hat avoiding the dinosaurs <laughs> yeah, yeah avoiding the dinosaurs yeah so it so people don't know the difference so they inherently uh attach themselves to the people around them and the ideas behind them so when you're telling someone you are wrong about something that they believe in and the people around them believe in that affects them not just like oh they're wrong but it like it breaks their ideals and what they believe in and when you do that it, ca it causes a lot of cognitive dissonance where they feel uncomfortable and they can't process that so instead they react 
and the reaction is emotional usually. So they get angry and upset and they double down on their beliefs. Even when someone can show them factual evidence, you are wrong. Here's right. the actual facts. Yep. They will double down on their beliefs. So you can't approach people in a sense of you're wrong, you're whatever, da, da. You have to like come at a place of empathy and open mindedness. And that's I'm sh- something that is like, I never read Daryl Davis's book, but I'm no. sure that's where he, cause he didn't come in like, oh, you guys are all racist. Like you, you're terrible people, blah, blah, blah. Right. Like he went in, befriended them and then showed them through example, like what it, like, you know, why they're, why they're wrong. It's and quite, that, it's, I gotta, I mean, it's a book I want to read and I don't even like to read. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But I, I, and I like that because I do think two important things. One, they're more ignorant people than stupid. All right. Ignorant means you just mm-hmm. don't know any better and you only know, you only know what the information that you're armed with. And if it's low information, you're ignorant. If it's high, mm-hmm. even if it's high information that's one dimensional, you're ignorant. Yeah. Now, stupid is something where someone gives you the information and, and there's no way, no, there's no way around rationalizing seeing what's an actual historical fact. And, and, but you're so set in your ways. So that's a willful ignorance that turns into stupidity, which is, which is harder to forgive than ignorance. Uh, yeah. um, you know, um, because there's no empathy because he's those some of those people you feel like they've gone too far. And and us, like our faith in humanity, we still we still trying to reach out to those people too, because that's how you're built. That's in, that's in your DNA. Like you said you're good at measuring people, mm-hmm. uh, measuring people and sizing people. people yeah. I am too, my man. And I know that's I know that's that's in you. Mm-hmm. And I know and that's one of the the cool things that makes you um i mean in, in the south bay that attitude is out here is golden yeah. you will always be you will always have star power and you will always be in, recognized recognized as an individual because of absent of the the immeasurable talent you possess you will always be recognized for being well there. i i always try to just step aside from my because mm. like if if ever i i have an emotional reaction towards something uh-huh. i always try to take a step back and be like what is the root of that and like most, I feel like most things stem from insecurity and people aren't easily ready to like let go of their ego. Mm. And I try to step aside from my ego and I, cause I want to come up with my own ideas, my own thoughts. I don't want to just be in, in like uh, what I call like an echo chamber of the people around you. And I feel like so many people are just echo chambers of, of their groups around them where like no one has their own individual thoughts. And it's not that they're incapable of individual thoughts. I think they're just they're just stuck in in these loops until you start letting them think freely. And then the more people think freely, like the more they can come up with their own ideas. They're like, Oh, I, I actually don't believe this. I actually don't think this way, you know? And then I feel like through that sense, you get people who become more open-minded and more calculated than they do reactive. When I was growing up, I had a huge problem with gay people. All right. Um, I grew up, um, well, Earlier years, like Catholic Lutheran, but you're mm-hmm. you're you're too dumb to what the to, to know what the hell anyone's saying. You know, you fall asleep during the sermon. You don't get the sermon. Mm-hmm. But then you reach these teen years, and my teen years, I was in a part of an Assemblies of God church, a Pentecostal church called Coney Island Gospel Assembly. You know, it's an abomination. It's a sin. These people are evil. The, the devil's in their head, and and you don't want to be around them. And this and that. Wow. And, and normally, you had a group of people that were fearful of those people, and then and normally there were people that were. They're like, that's their own thing. Why do I care what they do? I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm doing my thing. Let you do your thing, right? Mm-hmm. But then sometime between 1986, and this is important for you because you're young. There's a chronology here. Um, when the AIDS epidemic happened, mm. um, it was heavily rumored that it was a gay person's disease, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was a leader, a certain particular person from the NIAIH that said that it's no longer a disease that's sexually transmitted or from needles. You can get it from casual contact. Mm. and the guy was on 60 minutes right and the guy and they're like can you be more could you be more specific you know like i don't know if it was ed bradley or whatever cronkite or barbara walters can you uh, no we need you need to clarify that before you like look stuff up yes and then um well this is the leader from a a, a health organization yeah and i don't look to the official but when you have the name doctor right you, you, you're, you're, you're going to believe him, right? Yeah. Yes, on 60 Minutes. Yeah, it's pop culture. And he says, yeah. basically, when you're at Thanksgiving and you touch your grandmother, you can transmit AIDS that way. So what happened was there was this two-year period that you thought of a gay person touched you. You mm-hmm. get AIDS. Yeah. And then, I don't know the percentages, but like hate crimes, like gay bashing went up like this. 
you know, there goes yeah. that F word. We gotta, we gotta, we don't, we don't want him around here. I don't want no AIDS, you know? Mm -hmm. um, by, uh, by the way, the guy's name was Dr. Fauci. Of course. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was Dr. Fauci. Was it went the on, same Fauci? Yes. A the very same young, Fauci? a very no young. It wasn't yes, it, it was. Dude. Yes, it was. This guy sucks. <laughs> Fauci is <laughs> <laughs> Dude, no, he didn't. Are you serious? You said this guy sucks. <laughs> Dude, Fauci is the worst piece of shit. Dude, did you see that? I'm going to look up. I want you to talk, but I'm going to look up. There was an email that got released Tell me. that Dr. Fauci sent before they put out the mask mandate. Uh huh. He had a whole email outline. Yeah, a chain shutting down the no, no, Fauci no. declaration. No, no, no. This was a whole email that was like a separate email to like some board or some. I don't remember who it was to. Saying that the masks don't work, they're pointless, but they're yeah. still going to push forward anyways. Right. He said in email, he's like, yeah, the masks don't work. <laughs> they're yeah. pointless. And we still have, I do, I saw a lady today driving in her car by herself wearing a mask. Yeah, that's crazy. And old video circulating on social media shows that Anthony Fauci close talking about close context in the context of the conversation about childhood infections he spe speculates that if a close contact of a child is in, is in household contact perhaps there will be a certain number of cases of individuals who are just living with and and close contact with someone with aids or at the risk of aids who does, does not necessarily have to be intimate sexual contact or share a needle this is the picture this is the picture hold on let's let's sorry let's do that Sorry, what am I doing? Sorry, but let's let's switch to that. This is the very young Dr. Fauci. And we could delete this later, but see as we're seeing virtually as the months go by. We could edit this part out, but you need to hear this. Be involved and, and seeing it in children is really quite disturbing. When you say other close contact, give me some examples. Well, for example, if if the close contact of a child is a household contact, perhaps there will be a certain number of cases of individual who are just living with and in close contact with someone with AIDS or at risk of AIDS who does not necessarily have to have uh, intimate sexual contact or share a needle, but just the ordinary close contact that one sees in normal interpersonal relations. No way. Dude. Dude. Sorry. Dude, that scared people to death. Oh, well, yeah, because now this you're This is like... from, um, I don't know, I, I, I believe it was from 86, but possibly 1988. Mm -hmm. And um, imagine hearing that. And you don't want, of course you don't want your kids next to them. If you think, if you think AIDS back then is a gay person's disease, mm -hmm. you don't want your kids or yourself or anyone near AIDS. In fact, you might piece up any, any gay person that gets close well, to you. Yeah, and that's, that's controlling started, the truth. Started by this dude. Yeah. The, 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 you said, dude, what you said, the worst ever? <laughs> You know, I didn't want to mention his away, name dude. because, uh, um, but I'm like, yo, you got to be me. <laughs> He's the same guy. Now, everyone's saying that was taken out of context, but that's not taken out of context because the, the journalist asked him to give examples. So once you start giving examples, there's, there is no context. That you're full, saying that. That was a full statement. Yeah. Like, that's, how is that out of He's the long, He was the longest running government employee. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's still on. No, he's he's done. Oh he's yeah, well, he's done now. But he just actually he just collected a hundred thousand dollars to speak for a speaking engagement. Someone invited him to a speaking engagement, so now he's doing those at a hundred grand a pop. No way. Yeah, that's our that's our guy. That's our hero. Yeah, but here's the point I was trying to make. I grew up hating gay people. I grew up being scared of gay people, and then because because you weren't you were told something different. Like you you weren't told the truth. Yeah, and but but you're also in a setting. Yeah. Where everyone's saying amen, hallelujah, but it's, it's uh, abomination, yeah. Get, right? Hallelujah, burn in hell, you know? So you're in the surrounding with people that are Jesus freaks like you that are saying the same thing. So of course you're going to believe it. I'm yeah. young, I'm naive, I'm like 17, 15. But, but you uh, almost don't fully believe it. You're just echoing other people's beliefs. I no, I believed it. No, 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 but yeah. you think you believe it. Right. But you freely did not believe it. Mm. Because I think people don't fully believe things until they come to conclusions on their own, right. based off their own like research and their own thoughts and their own ideals. Mm -hmm. When they're spitting out information that other people tell them, that, that's what I was talking about, the echo chamber. Yeah. Where like, because you're not even old enough 
to like believe things and like to fully right like, to understand. And I, I feel mm-hmm. like when you believe something fully, it's like when you understand it fully. And so you were just an echo chamber of everyone around you saying this, saying that, saying that. I'm sorry. It's so, just your face when you found that it was Fauci. Yeah. <laughs> You're trying to talk to me, but you, had, you, you just went, oh. I'm sorry. You were trying to say something important, and all I could no, see I was I, your I, face. Yes. <laughs> now, here's where it changed. Here's where my, my, my mindset changed. Mm-hmm. I'm a volleyball player, right? Yeah. Or, or was, a longtime volleyball player. You can't be a volleyball player in New York City and not run into a, 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 um, a really good volleyball player who's gay, who's not gay. Yeah. The 30% of some of the best skill, skill set players in New York City playing in this league called the Gotham League. The Gotham League is, is, a, gay, is a gay league. Everyone in the league is gay. Um, well, not everyone in the league because they don't, they don't disallow people that are straight. You know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. a true equal, equal, whatever. But at some point, I'm going to run into people and I'm going to be close to them. I'm going to find out they're gay. And I'm like, I'm supposed to hate this guy. Why don't I hate this guy? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you why. Because all, all that other stuff was, was, was not what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a friend named Mike, Michael Kilgallen, you know. Uh, this guy, he's, he's an attorney, Michael Kilgallen. He wrote me home one time and... And I said something stupid like, I don't believe in Adam and Eve. I, I believe in Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve or something like that. And then I found out he was gay and I felt so embarrassed. I didn't talk to him for months and I finally called him up and and he's like, is this Jason? I'm like, yes. He's like, is this the Jason who believes in Adam and Eve and not Adam yeah. and Steve? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and and I was like, what am I doing? What am I hating? What 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 is going on? You know, and... and I'm I'm a completely different person with that mm-hmm. person. I mean, you, we all do go through transitions. There's a transition yeah. you go through with with sexuality. One, the first transition is, I don't care that you are right. And then the second transition is, okay, I do care that you are in a good way, mm-hmm. right? So, and I'm cool with either one. If one, if a person's like, I don't care what you do in your own time. That's your thing. That's mine. I'm still your friend. Boom. Or if you're that type of person, hey, I do care. I want to understand your culture more. That's both of those. To me, both of those are wins because not neither one is being non-inclusive. Mm-hmm. Neither one is being bigoted. You know, as far as their own personal choices. Yeah. Uh, um. Uh, and and how it relates into the general society. And and I've completely changed. But that took me t- almost twenty years. Yeah. Because you yeah you're to break, flip that because you, you're breaking down the the rooted beliefs that mm-hmm. were instilled on you. Wow. And the more information you had, the more you learned, the more you realized that your beliefs were wrong because you were given misinformation mm-hmm. and everyone around you was telling you like, this is true. This is truth. This is truth. And then you get older and then you can start making decisions for yourself and your brain starts developing like fully when you're like 25 to like be able to come up with those free ideas and um and once you come up with those free ideas and you're like wow maybe i was wrong about this i was wrong about this i was wrong about this and i feel like that's like the biggest transition stage is like you're kind of mid 20s to like late 20s is because that that's kind of like when i um i started thinking like wildly different as well you know it's like my mid 20s and um i mean everyone goes through like a stage so i was probably like a little bit of a shit when i was we younger. All, we all do yep. yeah and if you look at like almost like because uh, I, I grew up going to churches and stuff like i'm I'm not religious um anymore like i i believe there's other powers and things involved in the world right. and connectedness um but to say it's oh it's it's this guy from this book i'm like no i don't i don't you know believe that but two thousand years ago yeah. yeah but most of my pastors were people who were like fucking like one one of my pastors like nicest dude most genuine dude and he used to be a fucking pimp okay. and he was a multi-million dollar gangster and yeah. he like uh he had his like he he ran his hoes he did this he did this he like slang drugs he did all this shit and then one day he was just like you know i i need out i need out and uh so he left his girl who's his business partner and he took like a couple mil as like his cut Okay. And then she came and found him with some guys. They're like, give us some money. Like, if you really want out, like, you're not taking any money. So then he gave him everything and started from zero. 
and then built himself up, found God, like all this stuff, and became wow. a pastor. Yeah. And this huh. dude, like, you would not know at all. I mean, he's like this, you know, bigger Hispanic dude, like, nicest guy, though. Like, you see him, like, always got a smile on his face, just so grateful and so loving, and his family is wonderful. And this dude is just an amazing guy. But, and then when he told that story when I was like, uh, when I was in like youth group, he told that story, I was like, yo, the f- this guy used to be a G. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but people are like, oh, people will never change. People will never change. It's like, that's the most made up sh- I've ever heard in my life. Like, Agreed. you can change. It's tough. And like, I try to change every day. Like, I wake up every morning, I take a cold shower this morning. Like, and I never want to. Like, I f- hate it. I woke up this morning, I, w- I woke up this morning cold. So I was like, I don't want to take a cold shower. And I was like, well, f- I have to do it. So I take the cold shower. I'm working on my music, <sighs> trying to meditate. Like I'm eating better. Like I haven't drank in like, I don't f- know, like m- month and a half, something like that. And like, I'm, cause I'm focused on making myself better yeah. and like putting myself in. And, and that it's, it's a long road and it's, it's constant. Like you should always be working on yourself. It's not like a, oh, you go to a week seminar to better yourself and no. now you're a better person the rest of your life. It's like, no, it's something you have to work on, but people yeah. can change. Like that's- But also one of the bigger secrets of being an artist is to look, to do everything in your power to look timeless. Yeah. Like I'm not, t- I'm not asking your age and no one, no one, because no one would guess it anyway. Right. Like, yeah. I'm, like I'm 52. You're I don't 52? look, I don't look 52. Right. Oh, I thought you were like 38. No. <laughs> I look like a creepy 38. Right. <laughs> hey little girl. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> help. Help. No, but, um, if I shaved, I'd look, yeah. 16 i know yeah they'd be know. checking you wouldn't ma- you wouldn't even get into karaoke they'd be like yo this idea is fake son get out of here I know. <laughs> but you also stumbled on us i'm also and, and we're gonna wrap up in a bit and yeah because we got a decision soon. to make on this file the file is only uh, it has 11 minutes left <laughs> um like the file only holds 226 but damn i want to say something that you said before about misinformation mm-hmm. the biggest antidote against misinformation is critical thinking skills yeah. Misinformation never survives basic critical thinking skills, which is why I have a huge problem when someone's like, you're not a doctor. You, you can't talk about this. You're not a lawyer. You can't talk about that. When if you just use common sense and you put two and two together based on what you read and, and research in, you can come up with your own conclusions at mm-hmm. a certain level. Yeah. Now, if this, the interpreting the data, if the data is in fact true. Uh, uh, goes true. beyond your level of maintenance, then mm-hmm. then you're like, all right, let me get someone here to help me with this. The, someone who's a doctor. But on, on a basic math level, let's just give you an example. Let's say there's 100 people in a village, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say 90 of them got the vaccine. Let's say 10 of them didn't. Let's say five of those 10 people got infected. What percentage is that? 50. Right. Now, let's say of the remaining 90, let's say 30 of those 90 get infected. What's the percentage? Third. 33. So if you put on a piece of paper that percentage wise, more unvaccinated people got infected than vaccinated people, people are going to see the percentage and mm-hmm. think that that's a bigger truth than what it really is. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's true that it's 50%. But what they don't know, it's also true. It's five out of 10 people. Mm-hmm. And quantitative reasoning dictates that the smaller the sample size, the higher the percentage. So they're lying to you with the truth. Mm-hmm. It's hidden in plain sight because thirty f- people is is going to be more of a super spreader than five. Yeah, and like, and that's that's. But all that's it an is. example of how people would be like, "Oh, the doctor said this. Oh, you don't believe this? You're not a doctor." And I'm like, "No, no, I'm not following this. I'm not. I'm not trying to follow the science. I'm following the math. Yeah, the math. I, I know math. <laughs> the math is hidden in plain sight. But then you have you have doctors who learn mm. through schools." Mm-hmm that are like funded by governments and then the biggest scientific facilities are funded by governments. So the officials at the top are like, Hey, this is true. Like X plus one equals B. Mm -hmm. And they're like, this is truth. So then everyone learns this is truth. If you accept that as a given. Yeah. Yeah. And then someone else can come along and be like, well, X plus one equals X one. And they're like, no, it's B. Right. Because this, why? And they're like all the yeah all the top scientists in the world say it. well aren't they all controlled by the government right so there's so many things that the government can just change right. and be like this is truth now so then everyone learning it in schools that's run by the like with government officials right also there's also something called a bandwagon fallacy bandwagon mm-hmm. fallacy is when someone operates that uh, because a premise is popular mm-hmm. 
uh, that it's the truth. Yeah. Like if you name a whole bunch of doctors, they're like 99.9% of all the doctors say this is true. Um, and if you accept that as a given, based on an information, you're going to go with that. Mm -hmm. You know, but what happened in this climate, there were thousands and thousands of people who were um, censored. The, mm -hmm. the, look up the Great Barrington Declaration. That was it was started by three professors, three, three, three medical people, one's from Harvard, one's from Stanford and one's from Oxford. And the three of them got together and said, hey, we need to talk about early treatment. We, we, we support the vaccine. The vaccine probably might work and we're pretty sure it does. But if it doesn't, we need to discuss alternative forms of treatment, uh, you know, to get to get ahead of this early vitamin mm -hmm. D exercise, this and that. Right. And there was a chain email which was um, found on the Twitter whatever, mm -hmm. from the NIH, the CDC, and the NAIH that said we have to shut these people down. They, we can't let them be heard. And they, they, talk, they, they, talk, they call those scientists fringe. Yeah. The Harvard guy, the Stanford guy, and the Oxford guy, who spent their life in this particular wheelhouse of epidemiology, virology, and this and that, are, are all of a sudden, who built their reputation, Discredited. all of a yeah. sudden, they're fringe. But, right. the, but, but until this, their whole entire life, mm -hmm. they were the best in their field. Yeah. So they were deliberately, tactically um, structured against to make sure their voices wasn't heard. Yeah. Yeah. You look anyone who has Wikipedia that thinks I'm I'm dipping I'm wearing a tin foil hat or I'm in some conspiracy guy. I'm only going to say two things. It's, it's on. It's on. No, but it's on Wikipedia. Yeah. Well, there's spoiler alerts now, right? But um, Wikipedia has this. It tells you it look up the Great Barrington Declaration. Tell you how it started, which doctors, which medical professions were on board. Tens of thousands of doctors mm -hmm. and what and like minded or whatever, and, and just read it and just and you decide for yourself. If you decide I'm wrong, that's fine. You know, and I don't like the word conspiracy because I think the person who believes everything is true is just as dangerous as the one who believes none of it's true. That's where critical thinking skills comes into play. Yeah, I mean, I've, I I love conspiracies. I yeah. watch so many fucking videos uh, and like so much it's stuff. It's entertaining as talk. Yeah, it's entertaining, but like, <laughs> and like 70% of the time, it's like there's a lot of bullshit conspiracies. And then 30% of the time, I'm like, no, nah, this is just true. Yeah. Like they'll have like actual evidence of like government officials like shutting people down for stuff. Right. When they like proved they like created free energy or they created this, they created this. And then those people just are dead. Mm -hmm. right. It's like they're just dead. Yeah. Like right before they're about to like give a speech on this or they're going to talk about this and now they're dead. Right. And then all of a sudden all their files and all their stuff is taken. It's like Nikola Tesla. Nikola sure. Tesla had uh, over 80 trunks of documents that he, he had in his apartment. And when he died, after they found him, they found that somebody went through all his shit. Oh, my God. So someone knew. <laughs> so someone either killed him. I mean, he was like, he was like 83, 86 when he died. So could have been. They said there was a blood caught in his heart. Could have died from that. And then the FBI was just monitoring him. And so he died. They're like, okay, let's go get his shit while he's dead. Or, you know, they could have pushed him a little over the edge and then went in and took all this. Shit. And you gotta, you gotta think this is a guy who had schematics for like, and this is in the thirties who had schematics for cell phones, for mm -hmm. electric cars, for all the shit we have now, this dude had schematics for and for free energy. And he built his Tesla tower. Wow. Which was going to wirelessly send free energy with a, like anywhere around the world. And he tested it on a city, and the whole city lit up, and he ran the city off the power of his uh, Tesla top, or like a, off a miniature one. So he, he was building a big one, and he wanted to construct a really big one to like literally power the world with these Tesla towers. And who was his backer? It was J.P. Morgan. What did J.P. Morgan own? He owned all the electric companies. He owned all the timber companies, all yeah. the wiring companies, everything designed to build these uh, electric towers so mm. he would be out of business and his he would crash and jp morgan was his funder so nikola tesla hit up russia to fund him and they wired him like well not wired they 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 had a contract of like okay. twenty five thousand. and uh, i was recently watching a show about this and these guys went in to the um it's it's over in um uh, <clears throat> uh siberia is where the Nikola Tesla's all of his files are and like all this stuff. And 
they're like, yeah, can we like look at that file? And they're like, sure. So they showed them the first page of the document. They're like, oh, can we see the last page where like he signed it and all these other people signed it? And the guy's like, no. He's like, he's like, <laughs> this guy's like the director of the museum. They're like, what are you talking about? Uh-huh. And they're like, why, why can't we see it? They're like, oh, like sometimes you, like we're, we allow people to see it, but you have to go through all these procedures. So I'm thinking like NDAs, all this other bullshit. Like they can't have cameras, like all this stuff. And it's like, yeah. W- why? What the? F- That's isn't it crazy what they do? Like the like. It's crazy that they like, just steal someone's yeah. property and be like, oh yeah, no one else can we're, see it now. And we're releasing in fifty years. No, you can see it in fifty years. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like the JF, the JFK yeah. files was like like a fifty year thing. You couldn't you couldn't open it because of compromise or whatever. Well, a, a judge had to shame uh, the CDC and the FDA. Because they said the inf- we couldn't get, produce the information in 75, yeah. Pfizer, 75 years. Yeah. And the judge was like, no, you ain't got 75 years. You got till September or, or you're all in contempt of court. Yeah. So you're right. Well, they-, <laughs> they took all of his files and like all of his boxes and they took, uh, there was uh, 60 or 80. Mm-hmm. There was, it was 80 like boxes of over 200,000 documents and machines that he had built. Jesus. And... Uh, and that was all recorded because the FBI took it and they recorded all that information and then they held it for nine years. And then the government finally, uh, it was, um, no, they held it for way longer than that. They held it for like, I think the FBI had it for nine years and then it got transferred to somebody else. But then the documentation was finally released when Obama, uh, right before he went out of office, like had all the all the files released or whatever, you know, that he did. Mm -hmm. And so part of that was like mention of like the Tesla files. And he's like, yeah. So like, where'd you get that information? And they're like, dude, from the FBI, like the the documents stated, I think there's a lot of stuff that's blacked out, but the documents state. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of information that says like, oh yeah, 80 like boxes, like this amount, this amount. The guy's like, oh, well you got to remember this was like at the peak of, World War II in like 1943 where uh, there was a lot going on. So they, they took like, he's like, like you think that that's like that information is going to be accurate. Like they probably miscounted and just wrote it down quick. Cause there's a lot going on. It's like, you think the FBI who records immaculate information writing down was like missed that amount of crates by 20 and the reasoning is because the war was going on. <laughs> no, that's no. so stupid. No, they were. When someone redacts information, it's for two reasons: it's to protect people present tense who are still doing operational stuff, mm-hmm. or to protect themselves from exposure, um, where there are still people living that can pay the price for it, or to hide a bunch of shit yeah. that people don't want you to know about. But why do you think they said fifty years? They're like, let these people live, and when they die, yeah. you can't you can't prosecute, you can't try a dead person. Mm-hmm. That's why the JFK files and like maybe the CIA operatives, or if there was in fact a conspiracy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, I'm not saying there was, um, and also for YouTube purposes, I'd like to say the vaccine the vaccine prevents transmission because that's <laughs> you know, and and it's 100 percent safe. So I have to say I have to cite that for this episode. So big <laughs> thumbs up to YouTube and the vaccine, okay? But um, so we had to let's let's um. Let's do that for for our people. Right. But um, I think the point I was trying to make was that they're protecting people who don't want to live to be persecuted for it. Mm-hmm. Right? 75 years, the whole Pfizer thing. All of the people, like if there was some going on there, we, we can't do anything about it because it'll all be gone by then. And, they're, and in fact, their children will be gone. So the, this is the JFK thing. And again, I'm not saying that that's a conspiracy. I will only say that I don't think Oswald acted alone. You know, I fired him. I'm an expert in the M16. I'm an expert with a Beretta. Um, and I could throw a hell of a, a, a hand grenade. And it's just really, really hard to make a shot, fire off three shots at a moving target, you know, 800, 800 yards away going, or 800 feet away going left to right. Uh, and then you hit the president um, twice, including a headshot. Most experts will say the first shot is the most accurate because he's the one. That's the one where the car's coming towards you, mm-hmm. not when it comes this way. Because the further it's this way, the further the target, the smaller the target gets. So, and it's really hard to let off three shots in six point seven seconds or seven point one seconds. Um, Damn, yeah, I, I don't know a, a whole bolt lot about action because you have to fire. Reload. Then you got to cock the bolt. Then, yeah. then look through the scope again. Boom, and then cock, then scope again. 
You yeah. know, and most experts will say that's not an easy shot to make. I'm not saying it's impossible. That's why I'm mm-hmm. not ruling out he acted alone. I just don't think he did. But like that kind of pressure too. Yeah. Like I, I understand and by doing a guy it. who's not even a good shot. Yeah, right? If you look at his military records, like CBS, they did a special saying he was an expert marksman. Mm-hmm. So for the people listening at home, expert marksman is an oxymoron. They're opposite meanings. Because mm-hmm. in the military, when you qualify for your weapon, marksman means you were the worst. You, you barely qualified. <laughs> Let's say it's 40 targets. Marksman mm-hmm. means you shot 23 out of the 40 to, to 29 out of the 40. Okay. Now, sharpshooter. Is thirty to thirty six, so you're a better shot. You shot thirty out of so thirty six out of the forty. Expert is thirty seven to forty. You're the best of the best. At no point in this guy's military records was he an expert. He was only a sharpshooter once, maybe twice, and every other time he was a marksman. So you're trying to tell me a guy who's a marksman, who's the worst shot and probably one of the worst shots in his unit, um, shot came up with the, the, the shot shots. of a lifetime. Yeah, the shot of a lifetime. But they're they're giving him credit for these moments of brilliant brilliance. But but all of us. But his escape plan was was sloppy as. F- that yeah. th- those are the things that are consistent with that make conspiracy nuts be conspiracy nuts. For me, I'm just going from a critical thinking standpoint mm-hmm. on possibility. I don't. I think it's possible. I just don't think it's likely that this mm-hmm. man acted alone, and 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 hit the president twice. And and that the, and the third shot was a headshot. I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't want to talk the about. The last shot was a headshot. That's what I'm saying. But most experts would tell you the first one is the most accurate one. Him, but this guy, his his, it's his third. It's the last shot. Ask any expert on a rifle, and they will not tell you that the third shot is the most accurate one, uh, given this and, and the given circumstances. That was, they'll say that when the target's closer, slowing down and, and moving, the um coming towards you, and then s- slowing down to do this. That's the one that's the most accurate one. They'll, they'll, any expert. I mean, ask me. I'm an expert. Look, look behind you. Look on that wall. See that that badge says expert. My last six times I qualified for my weapon, I shot 40 out of 40. Except one Damn. time I shot 39 out of 40. That's fucking dope. That's my badge for my 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 Beretta. That's my badge from my M16A2, and I got another badge over there for throwing grenades the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> Not at you. <laughs> so just my opinion. You mm-hmm. know, again, no tin foil hat critical thinking skills not ruling out the possibility I'm not saying it's it's impossible it could have it could have been the, the most unique shot of a lifetime i just i just have a hard time seeing it that's all i'm trying to yeah. say you know because you've made that shot three um, times with my weapon yes with his with the scope that I, that you had to cock back and then look through the scope again you have to look through the scope again after you after yeah. you cock it back yeah. You know, but with my weapon, because the M16A2 has a maximum effective range of 460 meters. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can make that shot because that shot's 800 feet away. And I shot a 300 meter target three times. 300 meters, basically a thousand feet. Was it a moving target? No, but it was way, it was dude. so far it's, away. It's half, it's just the head and shoulders image. And it, and it pops up for 10 seconds and you have 10 seconds to make that shot. And I make that shot. So... So some targets are as close as 50 meters. In fact, your drill sergeant will tell you the first target is 50 meter left. That's I'm gonna give you guys. I'm gonna give you a gimme. Just make sure you aim this way because the first target is 50 meter left. You can't miss that. You could pick up a rock and hit that. You know. In fact, someone on the range did hit up with a rock. The last one was 50 meter right, and mm-hmm. he double pumped. He twitched. He double pumped, and mm-hmm. he let off two shots on one target. So the last target he was out of bullets. So he, I was his, I was his spotter. He Fair looked right. around, and he picked it to see, uh, and he grabbed a rock. Then he looked around again to make sure. And when the last target popped up, whoosh! <laughs> and he hit the target, and the target fell. He got, and I got dropped for so many push-ups because that <laughs> night, some people that failed that failed to qualify, uh-huh. the drill sergeant was yelling at someone, and he says, "Son, you missed fifty meters." He says, "You could pick up a rock and hit that." And I started laughing, and you think that. It's funny drop and i did dude i did so many push-ups and i was uh, i was he, he caught me laughing because someone in fact someone did in fact pick up a rock <laughs> he picked up a rock and hit at the target that's crazy. <laughs> oh man did i spin off no that's good oh man off. we gotta get we gotta wrap yeah, up gotta, let's um let's give you um Let's let's do a little IG thing a little website thing people okay. want to know about mr dive mc dive let's let them know who you are yeah 
what's what's your IG? Tell let, let everybody know where, uh, you, where they can find you and yeah, my, they so, want to know more. Yeah, my uh, my artist name is Dive D Y V E, mm. and uh, all my handles are only Dive. Only Dive. It's like the OG only fans. I don't wanna take another step now. Cause this shows your voice. Such a long way down. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I got both versions of New York. I'm it's from New been hard to even take a step, and even harder just to take a breath. And every moment that I thought we spent, I saw it going somewhere different than you saw it get. I love it. Like, I've been trying almost every day. And that's how we're going to gonna finish. Call you out for all of you at home, to be for all of you in your you iPads or desktops, it's my boy so MC Doc. You like I'm, so yeah. I'm Jason Tadeus. This is episode 166 of the Option Podcast. My brother. Yo, give it up. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure, dude. I don't want to take another step now It's such a long way down